the smoke radio for the masses. Headline of this is July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Welcome, Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the masses. Yeah, man, I just love saying it. Today is Tuesday, April 4th. 94 days into the new year, just 271 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR. The Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. I am your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? I am ready to go. It's going to be one of those nights tonight. If you got to, uh, you know, get a peek at the bunker cam, you know, right before the show. You know, Jack Carey on with us tonight. It's one of those nights that I know... I'm going to enjoy myself, and I'm going to find something out. There's nothing like a full-on, full paranormal evening, full frontal assault. And that's what we're going to do tonight. With Jack, I can go in any direction, which is cool. And literally, because he covers the four corners, right? <laughs> so, no pun intended. But that's what we're going to do. And he has got his organization, uh, the Paranormal Investigation Agency, along with, uh, you know, the infamous J.C. Johnson. And uh, we're going to have J.C. on in a a show in the near future. But uh, tonight's going to be Jack. And I'm sure J.C. is listening right now going, man, man, I want to be on tonight. You know, it's Jack's night tonight, J.C. (laughs) J.C. is cool, man. (laughs) Nobody looks cooler. And is on top of his game like J.C. Johnson. So we'll have uh, J.C. on, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks or next month. But that's uh, that's what they do there. The Four Corners area of the United States, there is something going on. You know, it's a lot like Joshua Tree and a couple of other, you know, Sedona. There's a couple of areas around the United States. They all seem to be out here out west. Uh, by the way, but uh, the Four Corners is one of those spots, man. So we're going to go ahead and do that all night tonight. We're going to open up the phone lines, too, as well. Tomorrow night is a very unique night. We have Anil Pandey here, and it's uh, I, I've been talking a lot about quantum theory, quantum mechanics, parallel worlds, uh, the many worlds theory. Well, it, it's it's going to be that or a little bit of that, but... He is also, he's a software guy. He's a musician, too. But he's a software guy, and he's run, um, when I say run, you know, like own uh, some major software companies. And he knows what's happening here. And he knows, uh, uh, how, how do I say, when it comes to the quantum level and the possibility of something else going on, whether it is uh, just another world, another dimension, what, who are we? Are we just a shell ourselves, you know, projected back into ourselves? Think about this. You know, is there another world out there? That's what we're going to talk about tomorrow night. So you're not going to want to miss that show. Very, very bright guy. Thursday night is another Fader Night with John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom Live. 
Call in numbers 323-825-5045. If you live in the Four Corners area, um, any one of those states, I do want to hear from you tonight, and certainly so will Jack. Okay, so I do. I want to know if you've, uh, not only with cryptozoology and Bigfoot and UFOs and ghosts, but just just anything unusual out there, skinwalking, you know, anything unusual, because it is a very unique part of the United States. So we're going to open up the phone lines a little bit later, and we do want to hear from you. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. That's what you want to do, at J Church Radio. Very simple, at J Church Radio. Use hashtag F2B. That is the sandbox. Uh, follow, like, and subscribe. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, like us on Facebook, uh, YouTube. Subscribe there. Uh, the way that we do the show here, everything is free uh, for you to listen to the show live. Any of the networks that we are on, KGRA, uh, Talk Stream Live, um, any, anything out there that includes iHeartRadio, everything is free. All right, and that includes YouTube. Everything is updated. If it's not live, it's updated the next day. There are plenty of archives out there, uh, iHeartRadio and, and YouTube, and you can go and, and listen to the show for free, right? And so that's what we do. Now, we do have the podcast. We have the membership area. Uh, all, again, unique situations. The podcast is there for people that like podcasts, that want to be able to have software and apps and downloads and and so forth, and they want to listen to it in the car and just plug it in and not think about it. Well, there you go. The podcast is there. It's just $2 a month. You can become a member. You want to go to the membership area. That's commercial-free downloads, commercial-free. Again, updated every single day. All right, we have four levels of membership. You can go from free all the way to the game changer. And, uh, oh, I wanted to let everybody know. So just go to the membership area, pick what works for you, and and go ahead and sign up and and uh, become a member, become a fade or not. Um, the uh, first wave for the game changers out there, the first wave of hats and shirts have shipped i cannot believe you guys are going to be so happy so uh, those are out uh we've got uh, some more shipping to do i mean it's just like shipping madness now um again if you haven't sent us your shirt size we can't send you a shirt and if and i'm going to say this i'm going to make a public announcement right now if you don't send us your shirt size in time i'm going to make the call and you're going to get a large <laughs> and that's it. You're going to get a large. And if you're if you're a 2XL and it don't fit, it's going to go to your kids. So think about that. All right? Send us when you sign up, make sure you you give us your shirt size. Okay? There's like I don't know. Uh, a dozen of you that uh, we're still waiting on stuff. But uh well, maybe not. Maybe not. I think it's less than that. But uh, anyway, uh, everything else has gone out. I can't even believe it. It's so cool. So cool. Autographed hats. And the the hats are embroidered. Man, they look so good. It was at uh, our shippers today. And uh, everybody there's like, man, I want one. I'm like, I don't even have one. And I don't. <laughs> I don't have one. They've all been accounted for. Yeah, man. So cool. All right. Where am I at? Let's see. Uh, Thursday night, John Rappaport, Twitter, Sandbox. Any questions or comments during the show tonight? As in every single night, use hashtag F2BQ. Uh, let's see. Where am I at? Podcast. All of our sponsors. We've got some new sponsors coming in this month. I, um, I'll make that announcement over the next couple of days, but uh, welcome them warmly. I did tweet out last night, and I, I, and I did it again today, the soap over at Life Change Tea. I, you know, and I say this all the time about Ronnie. Ronnie is one of the great companies out there, Life Change Tea, getthetea.com. And when he said last night that his newest product is soap and – and the 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 kids that he has got together to to make this soap all right that right there that story okay this is a group of autistic just you know kids that you know what they are making some kick ass soap and and so i agreed with ronnie last night 
that, A, the Fader Knots were going to get together. They were going to sell out on that soap. It's $6.50. And if you mention my name, $6.50. Change a kid's life, man. $6.50. And if you mention my name, you're going to get free shipping anyway. It's like Ronnie's doing this for free. And think about that. So go. We we put up the banner or we put up the links for that in Twitter. I want to see that sell out. And I made a deal with Ronnie last night. I was going to send fade to black shirts to that entire crew. And I got to tell you, man, uh, Mark Toronto wants a hat. Yeah. I'll say, do you, you don't have a hat, Mark? You don't have a hat? I'll send you one. It might not send say fade to black on it, but I'll send you a hat. I got plenty of hats. You want a fade to black hat? You know you got to talk. You got to talk to Rita, man. You can't put that out there in public like that and throw me under the bus. He can't do that. Now I have to send you one. That means I got to send everybody one. Think about that, Mark. So I'll just send you a hat. <laughs> I'll send you a hat. Um, anyway, uh, Rita, get the, get the uh, the page up again. Let's tweet that out for uh, get the tea dot com for life change tea. Everybody, I want I want that soap to sell out. I want those kids wearing fade to black shirts. I want to get the next picture that I get from them is that crew wearing fade to black shirts. All right, that's it. This is a family, and let's get her done. Six fifty. Buy two bars of soap. Get free shipping and change somebody's life. Change yours. Life change tea. All right. Uh, also, uh, get the tea doc or get the tea. <laughs> Fade the black blood. River Moon Coffee. That's uh, that's up there. Go and click on the banners over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. All right. Use promo code F2B Blend. Contact in the desert, May 19th through the 22nd. River Moon Coffee is going to be there. Now, just think about this. We are going to have a fade to black booth, right, for the fader knots. And then we're going to have the River Moon Coffee booth serving fade to black blend. And the what they've got set up, by the way, River Moon for uh, contact in the desert. I'm not going to let it out until, man, I just can't. In in about a week, as soon as, as everything is solidified, with them, how they want to promote it. I cannot wait to tell you what they're going to be serving there. I'm telling you right now, I know what's going on, and it's gonna, that is going to be a life changer right there. That is going to be a game changer. So they're going to be there. Robert Baval is going to be there. Jock Valet is going to be at contact in the desert. Graham Hancock, George Norrie, Robert Shock, David Wilcock, Corey Good, Jim Mars, Giorgio is going to be there. Richard Dolan, Andrew Collins. Uh, Stephen Greer is going to be there this year. Linda Moulton Howe, Whitley Strieber, David Serrata, Mike Barra, and the list is long. Just go and click on the banner right now over at jimmychurchradio.com. That's all you got to do. Click on it. Lodging, food, info, tickets, discounts, everything is over at Contact in the Desert. Click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com. All right. Uh, Friday night at Contact in the Desert, we're going to be broadcasting Fade to Black, so you want to be there for that. Uh, always a great event. Saturday night, I'll be hosting the Forbidden Archaeology uh, panel under the stars in the amphitheater. And my panelists this year will be Graham Hancock, Robert Baval, Robert Schock, Andrew Collins, Brian Forrester, and Carl Lauerberger. All right, so you want to be there from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. in the amphitheater under the stars. We've got a full weekend planned for all of the fader knots, so you definitely want to be there. All right, let's get this show cracking. Let's go. Man, I'm done yapping. Happy birthday to Robert Downey Jr. Today is 52. And Robert, who I love, will always make the list. Why? Weird science. I kind of want to lean on less than zero, too. <laughs> as creepy as that movie was, it's pretty amazing. Weird science, though. Also today, magician David Blaine is 44. I still don't know how David does it. I watch all of his videos. I'll go through a YouTube binge or Netflix binge and watch Blaine's videos back to back. Dude is talented. I don't know how he does it. Just the cards. If you deal just just with the card tricks, right? Hugo Weaving today is 57. Of course, he played Agent Smith in The Matrix. 
You see, Mr. Anderson, we've had our eye on you for quite some time now. You like to help your landlady out with her garbage. Agent Smith, today is 57. Our dead guy's birthday today, Heath Ledger. Yeah, man. Bummer, man. I don't even want to do it. 1979 to 2008. Happy birthday, Heath. Died at the age of 28. I first saw him in A Knight's Tale, but his role as the Joker in The Dark Knight, that was a game changer. But then it was over. He suffered from insomnia insomnia after uh, filming The Dark Knight and died from an overdose of prescription meds. And what was found in his bloodstream, I can't even pronounce these things, oxycodone, uh, dox, dox, li, dox, doxliamine, I guess, hydrocortone, diazepam, alprazolam, demazepam, temazepam, unbelievable. I mean, we were shocked. We were shocked. Happy birthday, Heath Ledger, man. Came and gone, 28 years old. On this day in history, another shocker, but it did happen. 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated at the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. Fate or fact, dolphins intentionally chew on toxic pufferfish to get high. <laughs> that... <laughs> Is this thing on? That's a fader fact. Is that a trip or what? Tonight, very special guest Jack Carey is here. We're going to do uh, a full paranormal night. His his organization is the Paranormal Investigation Agency. Tomorrow night, and Neil Pandy uh, for a discussion on quantum simulation. Thursday night is another fader night with John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom Live. The call in number is 323 825 five zero four five man the fader knots are the best man uh twitter twitter and the fader knots is it, it that's like peanut butter and jelly just like peanut butter and jelly follow us on twitter at j church radio hashtag f2b is the feed if you don't have tweet deck get tweet deck download it boom done and uh, you'll see what's going on right now in twitter it's absolutely an unbelievable what we've turned twitter into that's the fader knots you guys are the best. Well, yesterday, now look, everybody knows about my love for the heavy metal, right? Now, I love music in general. It doesn't matter. I was raised on jazz, a little rock and roll, and uh, I I know music. I love music, and I listen to what I listen to, but I loves the heavy metal. And that's that's where it's at, right? And and it doesn't really matter what form it comes in for me, but I love my heavy metal. And yesterday, I mean, I love music in general. And the fade or not, now, I'll, I, I've got something here that I'm going to read that was posted on Facebook today. All right. Um, but let me say this. When we started this show, and as it goes with just about any show, whether it's television or radio, Right. You the successful host are the hosts that are themselves. They're not trying to be somebody that they are not. They're not trying to fake it and fly it in, you know, and that is part of uh, uh, your journey of, of, of this type of career is making sure that the the person you are is who comes through or comes across on the TV. That's 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 what people want. That's what they connect with. They can tell when somebody is fake or is somebody pushing it or just trying a little bit too hard. All right? But with me, I'm just I've always been straight up what moves me. That's why I do the birthdays every day. When I do the birthdays, uh, it's not that's just not random stuff out there. These are people that uh, have guided me through life and have put me where I am today, like Robert Downey Jr. today, right? Hugo Weaving in the Matrix, man, okay? All right? So where I'm going with is this. If I talk about heavy metal, 
if I talk about, yeah, somebody just posted Rob Halford, right? If I'm talking about heavy metal, that's who I am. You know who else I am? I am UFOs. I am lost history. I am Egypt, right? I am the conspiracy and what's going on and trying to connect the dots. But I like to listen to heavy metal. Right? And you get that. You guys get that. Si- that's, you know, we've been able to make this connection. I've been very honest about this. And yesterday was Sebastian Bach's birthday. And I posted it, his birthday, on Facebook, and I tweeted it out. Um, I'm a Sebastian Bach guy, man. Skid Row, are you kidding me? Right? And uh, if if I played different bumper music on Fade to Black, I play Skid Row. I do over a coast to coast. Damn Skippy, I do. You know? And so if you... You know, if you hear Sebastian Bach or you hear me talk about heavy metal, you guys get it. But this, so underneath Sebastian Bach's birthday post that I did on on Facebook came this gem. Now, I'm not going to drop any names, but I'm going to drop this. Oh, man, you guys are good, man. <laughs> oh, Jordan, 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 your uh, t shirt and hat got sent out today, by the way. I saw it. I saw your name on the package. Sebastian Bach. And, and so under the post, and you can go see it right now. It's right there. It's on my Facebook page. But this is without naming names. This is what was posted. I listen to Fade to Black show sometimes. Jimmy Church is supposed to be an awake, I'm doing finger quotes, an awake and esoteric person. So here is my question. Does he not know that pop music was intended to mess up our generation? That the Stones and the Beatles were a CIA project? And that the disharmony of heavy metal music is supposed to cause aggression in people. And lastly, when such crap music was played to water, which Dr. Emoto froze and examined under a microscope, showed ugly formations. Well, that is the effect of crap music which he enthuses about. <laughs> like, what? Now, should I read that again to you? Somebody actually posts, somebody out there. Now, remember, somebody out there is walking around with this in their head, right? That's the first thing. That's a pretty scary thought. The second thing is a person that is posting this, and I'm not speaking specifically about this person, but somebody that would post something like this who is trying to talk about peace and love, right, awake and esoteric, then they're posting something negative and calling somebody else's music crap. Now, that it, 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 it negates, because it's so negative, it negates the purpose of the post. In my opinion, it doesn't make any sense. It's like a, it's a double negative, right? But you can't walk around and tell somebody else that their music is crap. You can't do that. You can't do that and call yourself enlightened, certainly. <laughs> and so... There you go. Now, saying that the Stones and the Beatles were a CIA project when they're both British bands, by the way, is is, is a bit of a reach. But, you know, it's a possibility. Uh, uh, is the fact that uh, uh, A440 is, is some aggravating tone and that, you know, oh, man, you know. Um, I, I got to tell you, uh, I, I listen to... Uh, the heaviest of the heavy metal, and I've never gone out and killed puppies, okay? I've never gone out, oh, man, I just want to crash my car into something. No. You know, just stop with that. Just stop. So it, I, I've seen the photographs of the water that was aggravated. Okay, all right. Interesting. 
I've seen 432 versus 440. I've seen it. CIA plot. Nah. Who was on the show the other day talking about Nazis? And uh, the, uh, the 432 to 440. Oh, I think it was uh, Jim Mars. It's a very interesting point. It is. It is. It's a very interesting point. But it's not going to stop me from listening to a Judas Priest or Skid Row or or Ozzy Osbourne or, or anybody else that you can name. So there you go. That was a post. So what do you think? So are all of the fader knots or all of us unenlightened? We're not awake. We're not esoteric because we likes the heavy metal. There you go. You can check out the post right now. You can go to fade. Uh, you can go to Facebook. Go to my personal page and and read it. I'm not going to say who posted it because that just wouldn't be cool. That just wouldn't. Tonight, very special guest Jack Carey is here. It's a full paranormal night tonight. Yeah, Ronnie James Dio. <laughs> Ronnie James Dio. Oh my goodness. Yeah, man. Black Sabbath. Satan. Tonight, Jack Harris here. It's a full paranormal evening. Paranormal from start to finish. We're going to go into every single zone. His organization is called the Paranormal Investigation Agency. Covers the four corners uh, uh, section of the United States. And so that's exactly what we are going to do. Tomorrow night, Anil Pandy is here. We're going to talk quantum simulation. Thursday night, another fader night with John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom Live with that. I'm going to get out of here and get back with Jack Carey. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Email is Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. I'll be right back. Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Hi folks, let's wind the clocks back 60 years. Food was different. Food provided health and nutrition, and using supplements was minimal. Unfortunately, now we have chemicals, GMOs, herbicides, and pesticides that can be quite lethal in the name of our food supply and, of course, the ever-loving dollar. Supplementing our diets can be very important to stay healthy. Cleansing from daily intruders to the body might be critical. Live strong and take charge. Log on to GetTheTea.com. Our herbal tea is a great way to cleanse from intruders. Our supplements is a great way to maintain and improve your health. When your health is not up to par, go to GetTheTea.com. No GMOs, no fillers, and organic. And very helpful in keeping you at the top of your game. Life is too short to feel, uh, you know what I mean. Stay in the game, at the top of your game, with GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. 
Again, get the tea.com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Klutsky with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station, where the Fade or Nots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Bass, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. Yeah, man. (laughs) Excited. Tonight, a full paranormal evening, man. Front to back, top to bottom, hither and thither. Let's do this. Jack Carey was a naval intelligence by way of a top secret SCI security clearance. This is the highest any enlisted person can get. With lifelong paranormal experiences, one day a New York reporter picked up on his life story and wrote an article. It's called Inside the Mind of a Paranormal Intelligence Agent. Shortly after, Jack came into contact with J.C. Johnson, the Indiana Jones of cryptozoology, who took him on as his protege. Kerry specializes in running the organization which is the Paranormal Investigation Agency, like a real intelligence agency. They infiltrate. They run undercover operations, all in an attempt to discover the truth and present it to the public in a pristine manner. They are self-funded. So no one can tell them what to do or how to direct their assets. All the pertinent photos that are posted are declassified. They're on their site. They have many that haven't been declassified because of various reasons with current investigations. The website is para, uh, paranormalintelligenceagency.com. The links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. And I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, Jack Carey. Jack, good evening. Good evening, Jimmy. Thanks for having me on. I oh, man. It. The pleasure is all ours, my friend. And, you know, this is, I, I love it when we have a first time guest and you get the first time guest disclaimer. So, you ready? I'm ready. The disclaimer is this it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. Where we start, we start. Where we end, we end. But we're going to end as friends. Are you ready? Hey, I like it. <laughs> all right. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, you know I've 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 pumped this up because the Four Corners area um, is is one of those spots in the United States. I don't know why everything is on the West Side. You know it, it seems to, but you know we've got Joshua Tree, we've got Sedona, we've got New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, uh, and of course the Four Corners area. So and and with that we can go in any direction tonight, and we're going to do all of that. But I want to back up first. We've got to talk about your career. I want to know, uh, you know, what you did in naval intelligence, and and uh, have you uh, uh, discussed with us what you can. But I want to start here before we back up a little bit further. Um, what is an SCI security clearance? I, I get people on this show, uh, different researchers and and people that have been in and out of uh, different services that talk about different levels of top secret. And I've never really been able to get to the bottom of it. You know, what is real and what is not. So help me out here and tell me what an SCI security clearance is. Absolutely. Well, it stands for secret compartmentalized information. And when you have a top secret clearance, typically you're allowed to see maybe one, maybe two pieces of any given puzzle. When you have an SCI clearance, uh, it's a clearance which allows you to see many more pieces of the puzzle put together. And my clearance was derived by the fact that I served on uh, special operations nuclear submarines and I dealt with their top secret communications. And so when you're getting uh, top secret 
messages coming across, um, you have to have a clearance that, that equals what it is you're reading. Um, and so that's really how I, I got into it. Oh, what was your gig? What was, uh, what was your MOS? Uh, but well, my actual MOS was as a radio man or a communication specialist on nuclear submarines. Oh, so there you go. So you would have to have the, the clearance of clearances, correct? Right. Everything is coming across. Now, uh, this is interesting. Uh, and certainly I know the audience just leaned forward a little further into their speakers and just went, oh, this is about to get good, right? <laughs> so let me – okay, a couple of things. Uh, with the Navy and with the submarine, did you guys uh, ever come in contact with a submerged, a USO? Uh, y you know, when you're on a special operations submarine, each of one of those departments is really uh, a an entity unto itself. So for say, for instance, there were a number of times when I saw the guys coming out of the sonar room that were white as ghost, but getting them to tell you exactly what it was that turned them white as ghost would be almost impossible. It's not, and not permitted. So, um, so you're not really sure if you came across those things, but you, you sort of suspect. What about in the lunchroom, you know, cafeteria time, you know, you're scooting your trays down and you're getting all that gourmet food that they serve on a, on a nuclear sub that we've all heard about. What about then? Any scuttlebutt going around about strange stuff going on in, in the water? You know, there people would whisper this or that. You would hear once in a while a huge ping on the outside of the, on the, of, of the boat, and it would be unexplainable. People look around like, what did we just hit? You know, it had to be something big, but no damage done, that, that sort of thing. Uh, interesting. Now, if something did happen... Is there a protocol to report something? You know, well, I, let, let me put it to you this way. You guys surface, right? And you're out on the deck and you see something crazy uh, leave the water and fly up into the sky. So I'm not saying you did see anything like that. But if you did, how would you report it? Is there a protocol and, and, and a system in place to report such an event? Well, of course, you know, as it would be a, a security report that would just go, simply go up the chain of command if, if something like that occurred and it was just seen by a, you know, a single guard outside the boat or something. Yeah. Now, if you did see something like that, are you still bound by your security and your oath? Could you talk about it on this program? Yeah. Uh, Abs not not if it's about anything I had seen while I was in the Navy. I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. But I can tell you also that my I didn't have that much paranormal activity or experiences going on while I was in the Navy. Now, prior to that, in my childhood, very much so. And afterwards, um, my interest in various mysteries led me to the decision that what needed to happen was the founding of a of a new type of paranormal investigation group that used the same sort of discipline, the same sort of technique, secrecy, um, that any intelligence agency would use in order to begin to study these phenomena in a way nobody else was, in a way that might allow us to glimpse further truths into what was actually causing them to happen. With uh, all of the talk, I mean, you do this, this is what you do. With all the talk of disclosure and, you know, having presidents on Jimmy Kimmel talking ETs, which seems to be like a monthly uh, occurrence now, uh, do you think that the government is, I'm sure that they are, but what's your opinion? Are they sitting on a pile of, of information with ET contact and they are holding it back from us Americans? Well, uh, yeah, I think that the body of evidence for that is it, for anybody that really delves into the subject will, you know, it's just a huge mountain of evidence to show that that was the case. But even beyond that, what I think is going to be more interesting to the public is, I, is the eventual and future disclosure of our secret space program and just how extensive it is and just how um, far that they've gone without telling the American public is going to be something that is going to really um, cause a, a lot of problems in our society, I think. Where did you grow up? 
I grew up in Oklahoma, actually. Okay, so you're still there. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I've been gone. I, I left for Colorado for uh, almost 20 years or more, and I've recently returned here back to where my family is and doing some investigations here in uh, Oklahoma um, having to do with dogmen, actually, which I'm sure we'll get to. Yeah, well, oh, man, it's going to be one of those nights. I, I, can, I can just see it coming. Um, were your parents into this too as well? Did they have an open mind? Well, you know, not necessarily. Um, we grew up in there. Uh, they had me in a rural town named McAllister, and we lived in an old house um, that was built prior to the Civil War. And as a child, um, Often we would come down and find all of my mother's dishes completely shattered to pieces on the on the kitchen floor. Nobody would have heard a thing all night long, and this happened a number of occasions to the point where she she actually came up with latches to to lock the cupboards at night. And uh, more than one occasion, I would walk up a, a three flight staircase, and my my sister's bedroom was at the very top, and I would look in and see a, a full shadow entity just stroll across the bedroom and of course that created terror <laughs> and I go screaming down to my parents bedrooms and you know jump in bed and say hey, mama mama I saw this I saw this you know and of course they would you know say oh it was just child's imagination but um, but yeah that's really and it started at a very early age noticing these things did the ghost uh, have a name you, you know it's it's funny because you know our grandparents you know you'd go visit something happened in the house and and it doesn't matter where you are what family or what part of the united states you know but you know what was oh that's our ghost you know <laughs> did, did yours have a name did you know who he was or she no uh, actually not a name at all but i can tell you as a as a child uh, across the street i had a good friend and uh Today, he's actually a well-known horror author. Um, I, I won't say his name because I'm not sure he wants me to d tell the story. But as a child, he would come over to my house and we would go ghost hunting looking for this ghost that um, we kept seeing. And he swore at one point he saw somebody staring down from one of the upper bedroom windows. So it's interesting that uh, we both got to share this this paranormal phenomenon. And, and he went his way and I went mine, but both affected by it. And what about the skies of Oklahoma growing up? Did you ever see anything that you couldn't explain? And that Did that help you go on the path that you're on now? No, not necessarily. Uh, UFO phenomenon. As a child, I was endlessly fascinated with the stories going on about Muddy Boggy Creek and uh, all of the Bigfoot sightings that were happening right on the Oklahoma-Arkansas border. And um, it, that really caught my attention as a child. And and I, after that, I wanted to know and learn and hear anything I could about um, not only that creature, but a number of other creatures that me and JC have have been hunting for a while how did you meet jc well it wasn't long after they wrote inside the mind of a paranormal intelligence agent that um i saw jc on on a number of documentaries and i approached him and uh he didn't live far from me i was uh, in evergreen colorado at the time and he was down in farmington new mexico and so I approached him and asked him if I might be able to tag along on some of his investigations and um, and learn from him. And so he he agreed great graciously. He is a wonderful human being. And I went down and began to work with JC, and we we've been working uh, together ever since. What is it about? Oh, okay, I, you know I talk about the four corners, and I think a lot of uh, people hear that reference a lot. It it does exist. It's a real spot, and you can go and. And try to stand on the four corners, you would need four feet. But um, what are the four states that intersect on the four corners? Well, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, and Colorado. And what makes that area so special? I mean, because it's got it's got all of the five elements, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, it's, oh, it does. It's you know. As investigators, we refer to it as as the Disneyland of, of paranormal. Um, not far from the actual, you know, line of the four corners is what's called the San Luis Valley. And 
That's also known as the Mysterious Valley because of the sheer amount of paranormal activity that takes place there. Now, it's it's one of the world's largest alpine valleys. It's 50 miles or 70 miles long and 50 miles wide, and it's surrounded with pristine 14,000-foot mountain peaks that have huge quart, crystal quartz deposits. And not only that, it's a valley that a number of indigenous uh people have claimed is is their garden of eden their place of creation um the place of the sipapu where they emerged up out of a hole out of the ground after a great disaster occurred that's all in the san luis valley and what's interesting is that in this valley you get every manner of paranormal report coming in from bigfoot sightings to uh skinwalkers to uh ufo uh, sighting non-stop UFO activity and sightings and so on ghost activity and the you know each report when you examine them these people are only three miles from each other all experiencing this just wide array of paranormal activity and it's examining that valley really that kind of led me into the idea of, of what I call the unified field theory of paranormal activity the fact that it could be that what we're seeing is interdimensional activity. And um, according to modern physics, the only thing that separates dimensions is a uh, electromagnetic membrane. Well, there, there are quartz crystal deposits um, large enough uh, that they can sufficiently generate the right kind of frequencies in order to create a tear in that membrane. And when that tear occurs, you get momentary interaction between dimensions, and we describe that as paranormal. And it it's if if that is the case, and I'm right with you on this, that means that that uh, that explains so 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 much, right? It it ex, it explains the orbs, it explains the UFO activity, it, ex, it explains ghosts, uh, shadows, skinwalkers, Bigfoot. Everything kind of comes into play here, but. It, the, sometimes the simplest explanation is the best one, isn't it? It is. Sometimes, you know, Occam's razor and all of that. Also, one of my favorite quotes is, whenever you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, has to be the truth. And sometimes it's very hard for us to swallow the truth because of just how improbable it may be. But what's interesting is that we have a... a a long oral history from the indigenous tribes describing these areas as being areas where the veil between worlds is thin, as they call it. Well, now we have a group of physicists telling us there's an electromagnetic membrane and it's separating these dimensions. And yeah, it can get thin. <laughs> you know, So one, one is corroborating the other in such a way that we're beginning to get a much wider picture of, of what's actually going on in a number of these phenomena now. I also believe that this is sort of a tree that has two branches. And it was Arthur C. Clarke who once said that any sufficiently advanced science will be indistinguishable from magic. And what I began to see in, in, in just a wide array of what we call UAD cases, which is what led me to this, to this ulterior idea, UAD cases are unexplained animal deaths, more commonly known as cattle mutilations, which is the worst misnomer in history because they are, uh, you know, laser precise incisions. Have you um, seen, have, have you seen uh, uh, a mutilation yourself with the uh, laser cuts? Oh, yes. Now, I, I, I kind of want to know. Let me look at the clock here. Okay, we're good. Uh, when you first witness something like this and look i've talked to linda moulton i've asked her this question so many times because i'm fascinated with it i haven't seen it myself but what goes through your mind when you see this because it's obviously not an animal it's not an accident um what goes through your mind uh, you, because you're trying to explain it to your brain right to keep you from going crazy i mean what goes through your mind when you when when you first see these well as a an investigator you know you're it really sets your mind a whirling um you go from from the idea of maybe this was a interdimensional predator maybe this was a a secret government 
you know, <laughs> operation of some kind. Maybe this was aliens. Maybe, I mean, it, you go, you run the gamut, and it was because of that, and because we came across not just cattle, um, as she, as Linda Howe knows, uh, all across the world in major metropolitan areas, um, people are finding cats that have been cut perfectly. Uh, in half with some type of laser device and the middle portion of the cat is completely gone. Um, the rest of the animal is left behind. But we're talking about this happening in, in a wide array of, of wildlife. We've uh, elk, deer, um, there have been lizards found in the wild that were perfectly dissected. And so what I came to believe was that what we were looking at was just what Arthur C. Clarke had described. This is a science so advanced that it looks like magic. And the only people that can produce that kind of technology is what is known as a type two civilization on the Kardashev scale. Right. Um, and this, you know, these are civilizations that have the ability to, to basically harness all of the power of their star. Well, that allows you to eventually develop the kind of technology that you would have to possess in order to create the phenomenon that we are seeing. And so do we, what do we have here? We have a science that appears like magic. What, um, what, what's the intention if it is, if I, let's just say it's interdimensional or it's ET or it's even the government, okay, it, it doesn't matter. The animal mutilations are occurring. Why are they occurring? Well, yeah, I believe it's all tied to what are known as prion proteins. Um, we did a very, very in-depth investigation, and a lot of it was based off of um, – an investigation that the National Institute of Discovery Science had conducted. And as everybody knows, that's Robert Bigelow's group that um, once upon a time descended on the Skinwalker Ranch. That's, that's right. A different story. But um, they produced a report by which uh, they discovered that in the 1960s, there was a uh, government scientist working in a facility, a secret facility at Fort Collins, Colorado, and he traveled to New Guinea to collect uh, samples of Kuru virus. And he came back uh, with the Kuru virus and he began to inject it into different species of wildlife in Colorado. One of those was a deer and that deer escaped that facility. And it's the very next breeding season that we have the very first outbreak of chronic wasting disease in North America. Now, in cattle, this is called mad cow disease, and in humans, it would be Jakob Kreutzfeld disease. The point is that it's all caused by the same thing, which are prion proteins, proteins that are so virulent and so strong that, that they, you can't even kill them with 1,300 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. I mean, they are, we don't even know really where they came from. Um, but what we came to believe through our investigation is that what happened is, is they, we inadvertently um, contaminated the North American food supply through this action. And what is interesting is that deer and elk don't pay attention to barbed wire fences. They hop right over them. Right. And, right. They, and they start to graze on the same fields as the cattle, but and unlike a cow, they don't rip the plant up and eat the whole plant. They nibble at the top and they leave saliva deposits. And those cattle come up behind them and they eat the whole plant. And now the cattle supply, the beef supply of North America has been contaminated. And it's at this stage, um, right there in the 60s, that all of this began to just explode. And what I believe happened was that this civilization realized that the food supply had been contaminated and all of a sudden a new operation was begun in order to watch it and see what they could do to combat it. Um, because we got, you know, animal mutilations all over the world. It couldn't possibly be one government organization. Um, this is whatever we're interacting with is, is something on a much, much larger scale. One of the things, and we'll do this really quick uh, before the break, one of the things that Linda does talk about, and I want to know what your experience is, um, that these animals appear to be dropped. 
right, that there's no footprints, there's no tire tread, there's no interference around the bodies. They just are there. Is that the same experience when you're doing an investigation that you found? Yeah, in fact, one of ours wasn't a, a cattle that had been dropped, although in almost every case, we, yeah, when you we push the end, we look on the underside of the animal, the entire a bone structure has just been crushed and uh, there's often a, a big indentation underneath the animal where it was dropped from the sky but in one of our investigations which we have uh, on our deep black report dealing with type 2 civilization was a uh, a field photo sent in to us by a, an electrical worker outside of oregon and he went down this rural rural road to go find a transformer that needed to be repaired and he gets closer to the pole he needs and looks up, and there is a, a full-grown sheep laying on the very top of this very large pole. Um, no, you know, we went through every possible scenario. Could this have been a, a giant lion that crawled up here and left this thing? Could it have been this or that? Right. Uh, tornado blow it up there to get hit by a train well if that were the case it would be a big bloody mess this thing was in perfect condition laying on top of a giant electrical pole and the hole underneath of the animal completely smashed and that's an animal that got dropped from the sky in the wrong place right 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 a mountain lion or oh, i don't i don't see how anybody could or anything could carry it up the pole it had to right. have been placed there or you know, a very large crane, but nonetheless, nothing natural, right? Right, exactly. Now, um, when you, again, when we're talking about something like this, as as gnarly as it sounds, as crazy as it sounds, um, and it's it's an uncomfortable subject to to speak about cattle mutilations, horse mutilations, cat mutilations. This is a difficult subject because we are emotional beings but it doesn't stop the fact that this stuff is going on why um uh oh okay why is it going on we've kind of addressed that but with the mad cow crazy virus out there uh being contained were they successful in in doing what they needed to do in in containing the virus and and figuring out what's happening uh, you know, that's a good question. We, we're not quite sure where about in their operation they are, but what it appears to be is a worldwide operation. And the fact that any type two civilization. Oh, I lost Jack. Of, oh, there you go. You're back. You you silenced just for a second. Um, Jack, we're going to reset. I just want to make sure that we have a solid connection, but we're going to take a break here anyway. We're at that point. Are you with us? Okay, I'm going to reset Jack. This is Fade to Black. Perfect timing. They are listening. That's all I've got to say with that. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Jack Carey, the Paranormal Intelligence Agency. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at jchurchradio. Take a break. Be right back. More with Jack Carey. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. Hello, I'm Katini, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. Well, the... <laughs> yes. <laughs> We are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. What's up, Fade or Nots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much 
that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full range boom boxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just 129 bucks and use the promo code JCRTWS and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner, go back Lee Tappy. Balance of Nature's Fruits and Veggies. I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. I went from being able to work 14, 16 hours a day with no problem to where I could barely walk a block to the store. I went on to the phytonutrients about six months ago, and within a couple of months, my medical doctor had cut my prescriptions down in a, a little bit smaller dosage. The next time I went back a month later, I walked into the doctor's office and he says, my gosh, what's happened to you? You don't even look like the same person. He looked at my legs and the swelling had gone down. My blood pressure was down. The venous stasis ulcers that I had had on my legs for the last four or five years because of the poor circulation were all healed, and I'm feeling far better. The new challenge will allow you to receive two months of Balance of Nature's fruits and veggies free. And we'll even ship them to you free. Call now for details. Call 1-800-2468-751 or go online to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code TALK. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. You can follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. Come and hang out with us. Going to do two, three, four thousand tweets tonight, and you want to be in on the action and the conversation. We have Jack back. Jack, you know, that's what's really funny. As soon as you start bringing up government agencies, covert activity, Boom, right? <laughs> Just, right. Uh, I mean, that was on cue, man. That was on cue. Um, <laughs> I, was, I used to get really frustrated over the years. You know, I used to get, but, but I'm just so used to it. As soon as a conversation goes in a direction, it's, it, it just happens. And I don't get frustrated anymore. It's just a part of the game that we play uh, with whoever is listening. Um, when you go out on an investigation, uh, what's some of the equipment uh, that you take along? What do you use? Uh, you know, we use a, a lot of different kinds of equipment. And you basically use your equipment like a tool bag for whatever particular job you have. Um, one of the our favorite things right now is that we'll be able to basically pull into any area we're conducting an investigation and launch out many drones that go out and take complete aerial um, photographs and it's live video feed right back to the uh, to the cab of the truck without us even having to get out of the vehicle and that allows us um, to not only go into an area completely undetected really but then tells us in which direction we might need to look further um, some of the other stuff that we have now are, are tiny little thermal cameras that fit right onto our smartphones that uh, you can see a hundred yards out six different frequencies of light there it's amazing technology that's coming out right now and i think that's part of the reason why we're we're beginning to get a better picture on a lot of the phenomenon that take place is because of the advances in technology and in the equipment that we use what about night vision absolutely we have uh, everything from night vision rifle scopes um to night vision binoculars um but, it, you know, the new new hot thing is thermal technology because night vision is very good, but it's hard to hide a, a, a body heat signature even through thick bush. And so. what kind of things are you starting to see? 
Um, well, you know, it's just allowing us to be able to move around in these investigation areas in, in a much more fluid and, and clandestine way without being detected. Before, you know, you got a flashlight in your hand and you're whacking through with a machete and anything that's out there, you know, knows you're coming from a mile away. This allows you to, to really penetrate an area and, and get in there without it detecting you. And we're beginning, it's beginning to allow us to see on the fringes of our efforts uh, more and more activity and I think the more that we actually utilize the, the newer cameras that are coming out the more evidence is going to accumulate well one of the things that I'm very fascinated with as with uh, uh, our audience is night vision and what is going on in the skies that you just cannot see and it's 24 hours a day there is stuff going on in the skies uh, what kind of stuff are you guys seeing out there um in the skies is it is it every night you just point you know your night vision up and there's something there not every night by any means I, you know we were able to to film a ufo over the foothills outside of denver using a night vision camera and this craft was one of the strangest things i've ever seen i we zoomed into it with a really powerful uh camera sony night vision with the carl zeiss lens and could see uh, its shape, which was roughly circular, but then it began to spin around in place and morph into all of these different shapes. And it was one of the most amazing things to watch. I, I got the feeling that it was there performing some sort of environmental function. Uh, beyond that, I couldn't really tell you, but there were uh, three of these craft, only one of them by which was close enough for us to actually get video footage of, but that's on our UFO. Um, page on the website um, as well as on YouTube so you can go take a look at it and and I'm going to uh, everybody you can go to uh, Jack and uh, JC's page paranormal intelligence agency dot com the links are over at Jimmy Church Radio dot com because you do need hyphens to get there <laughs> so uh, the easiest way would just be to uh, click on the link over at Jimmy Church Radio and, t and it'll take you straight there um, what did you, when you see something like that, and I'm, I'm very curious, uh, uh, this sounds like an extraordinary sighting when you see something like that, and this one specifically, are you thinking us or them? Do you think it's our technology or is this something else? No, uh, absolutely something else. Um, whatever kind of whatever civilization had the ability to manufacture, to actually build a manufacturing plant that could produce a technology like that is not something that I think that we're currently capable of. Now, that's not to say we don't have extremely advanced secret space um, a program going on with craft that would probably just blow our minds. But when you see something that can literally it looks like it's being controlled almost by a nanotechnology, and um, I believe personally that in a number of, of UFO sightings that these are in fact alien drone craft. I don't think they're actually being piloted by aliens. I think that these things have such an a, a, artificial intelligence to them, that they are sent out to perform very specific functions in which they rarely make a mistake. And uh, that is a civilization that, you know, what are we going to do with that? <laughs> There's no fighting that. You know? Yeah, I'm looking at the video here. I'm at the very beginning of it. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, was it was it moving or was it stationary? No, stationary in place, and it was uh, simply spinning uh, in place as it was doing this. The uh, it, What happened at the end? Did it fly away? No, in fact, it, it, it kind of just slowly moved backwards and faded off along with the other two craft, just slowly got further and further away back into the mountains to the point where we couldn't pick it up with the cameras anymore. Yeah, this is very similar to what uh, I saw last year. It's uh, very, very close. I've always described it as a, a green chrome uh, Christmas ornament. You know, right. that's that's what it reminded me of. It was a solid object. Um, there were the reason why I say it was solid. There were uh, other uh, there was hundreds of people there that were witnessing this along with me. 
And when they hit it with, I spoke about this last night with Stephen Greer, when they hit it with lasers, I could see it in the night vision with the binoculars. I could see the laser sparkle off of it. So the laser was reflecting off of the object as it wow. uh, as it flew away. It was uh, pretty incredible. But it looked very, very similar to what I am seeing here. How far away was this from you? Do you have any idea? Uh, you know, we really don't. We were using a, a pretty powerful zoom lens on this camera so i mean it was quite a distance from us but um oh it is definitely spinning wow that is trippy man right yeah and uh, i just watched it do this that little hourglass thing that that's pretty this is a good this is a great video thank you yeah this is great this is great stuff um, the, oh man, I, I just want to sit here and stare at it. That's not really good radio if I do, <laughs> but, uh, wow. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. The, um, uh, the interdimensional part of this is an interesting, uh, for me, uh, comment could, uh, could all of it be interdimensional in that, uh, uh, the the UFO sightings combined with Bigfoot, they there's a lot of witness testimony that talk about you know seeing a, a UFO in the sky and then suddenly seeing Bigfoot on the ground nearly at the same time. That's where you have to deduce that this probably isn't beyond coincidence that the two are related. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, what we've discovered is that in at least 20% of what we consider to be highly credible Bigfoot sightings, a UFO is also spotted at the scene in the sky at the same time. And recently, uh, some of the world's best remote viewers run by Major Ed Dames um, targeted Bigfoot. And what he claims they saw was a, a black device, some sort of device in space that was able to somehow transmit the living essence of this animal onto the earth in such a way that when it's here, it's fully living and everything. Um, apparently, this was such advanced alien technology that this device could do that and uh, captured the, the life essence of this thing. They, they also claim that they believe that the reason why it was doing that was and creating a lot of other anomalous uh, happenings around the world was that it, it wanted the human race to begin to look past what was actually causing those anomalies. And when it does, they, th they think it's going to lead to some sort of contact. Now, this black device they describe um, as, as being the projector, of, of, of you will, um, really fits perfectly the descriptions and pictures that we have of the so-called Black Knight satellite, which is, a, you know, this satellite device that's been circling the Earth for a very long time, and nobody knows who built it. The uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sitting here watching the video. Uh, I'm going to, let me do this. This is the UFO page. I'm not going to grab the specific... Uh, 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 but everybody, you can just go to the page yourself. There it is. I've, I've got this posted pretty, pretty incredible video. The, um, the, the craft that we saw, uh, left the atmosphere. I watched it, uh, fly for about five minutes and then go up. It, it, it became a pin prick, you know, it looked like just another star. It stopped and then it turned left. Um, that indicates to me that it's probably not from here, right? And when you this object here, did it did it dissolve into? Um, uh, you say that it, it it joined a couple of other crafts and then left. Um, did it turn into a pinprick? Did it? Did do you think that it left the atmosphere, or do you think that it stayed here? You know, it, it got smaller and smaller, kind of like a pen prick of light, but then it just it seemed to just kind of fade out all to black, which we thought at the time was it just moving further and further west west of our location. The um, the technology that you guys are using, 
uh, that's the help of science today, right? Science and technology is is helping us move forward with this subject. And we have, and I'm glad that you brought up uh, not only uh, parallel situations or interdimensional, but uh, science is is right there. You're talking about uh, different degrees of civilization, you know, type one, type two, type zero. Um and we have the exoplanets, and everything right now is, like, converging. Do you feel like we're at the point of, like, this dam bursting and, and this is, we're going to have a breakthrough of proof of, of, of uh, that life isn't what it's supposed to be and what we have been taught? Oh, yeah. I, I think the, the mountain of evidence is just building and building, and a lot of this kind of ties into current web bot predictions about certain disclosures that are that said to be taking place not only now, but over the course of the next year or so. And a lot of those had to do with Antarctica. In fact, so much material was being produced by the by Cliff High's web bot regarding Antarctica that it, it became overwhelming. And a lot of it had to do with uh, ancient alien technology being discovered. Right. Um, apparently in the form of pyramids and that in some of these pyramids there are operational power systems uh, of a technology that we simply don't understand and uh, I think that it's going to take a breakthrough kind of like that that's going to open the floodgate um, for for humanity to really accept a lot of what it is that's going on well and what and what what about the quartz deposits? You had mentioned that uh, going on in the valley there in the Four Corners area. Do you think that there's a direct connection with, with the quartz and either the attraction or portal or maybe even a stargate? I do. Well, what's interesting is that in these areas where you have these huge quartz deposits, the electromagnetic fields being generated, or like in Sedona, are 500 times the amount of the surrounding countryside. Right now, those are huge uh, amount of energy, and I believe that that's sufficient energy to actually create the rip in the membrane that's allowing this momentary action to take place, and it, it sort of manifests in a lot of different types of paranormal activity, and and that's why we see them in such close proximity to each other, geographically speaking. Well, and then the question comes into not only with Antarctica, that which is why I'm asking about the quartz, when we're talking about pyramids and and granite and quartz and these different uh, uh, rocks and crystals that can not only carry a frequency, but that are also affected by EM and, and other types of, of electricity. Is everything connected? Yeah, well, these may very well all be connected um, on, you know, what's known as the, the Earth's power grid system or ley lines. There was also a pyramid reportedly discovered in Alaska, not right. far from Mount McKinley, that uh, Linda Howes recorded on as well. And that the descriptions coming from her military contacts spanning over a number of years predating uh, what's going on in Antarctica um, and the uncanny uh, descriptions of exactly what we're getting from certain contacts um, in Antarctica is truly amazing. And some of the same testimony coming out of both stories between witnesses that are years apart and have no contact with one another. Uh, what do you think is going on ultimately in Antarctica? It, it, my audience, that's all they want to hear about today, right? Uh, I'm over a coast. Whatever. The, the emails, the posts, the tweets. Ask about Antarctica. You know, that seems to be a lot of activity going on down there. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, what's your gut? Well, I think the web bot's correct. I think that not only do they have um, these pyramids and Antarctica, reportedly one of them is 20 times the size of the, pyra the Great Pyramid of Giza, um, and a an existing alien technology inside of them, but uh, apparently they've also discovered bodies. And these were human-like bodies uh, spanning 10 to 12 feet tall with elongated skulls. Um, it is being theorized by a lot of historians that these may have been the Atlanteans, um, you know, of ancient lore. 
And uh, right now, there's just been a nonstop parade of very notable people who have gone there this year. Um, a lot of them at times and dates when they knew nobody would be watching, including John Kerry on Election Day. Yeah, yeah, that was interesting. I mean, every, you know, you've got the Vatican, right? You've got uh, Buzz Aldrin, uh, everybody going down there seemingly just about at the same time. Um, and we have uh, the issue, you know, the, the ice is melting. So maybe something is getting exposed. And exactly. yeah, that, that's the part that I find so interesting. And with not only Google, but other private companies now that have uh, a multitude of satellites that are creating images of Earth uh, for commercial sale, right? If you've got the money, you can have a satellite positioned anywhere. And I think that they're trying to get out in front of this story before something gets, you know, into the public domain that they're not going to they're going to have a hard time explaining away. Oh, absolutely. You know, the ice has just melted enough that those pyramids are now clearly visible. Not only those pyramids, but if you will, uh, if your listeners will check out a group on YouTube known as Secure Team 10 and look at some of their Google satellite imagery of alien craft embedded into the ice. It is it's truly amazing stuff. Um, but the WebBot is also predicting that a, a lot of these finds are going to be put out there into the public sort of as a, uh, a way of taking their attention away from a lot of other problems that are going to start occurring with world currencies and, and such. Well, when you have one thing, one thing that is proven, whether it is, uh, you know, parallel world, man, many worlds, a theory part of, of quantum mechanics and quantum theory, we have that. But if one little thing breaks, that means all of this has got to start to get dis discussed and at a very, very serious scientific level. And I think that we are very close to this because there are so many reports of Bigfoot. Um, you've got uh, lots of dog, man. And I actually want to address this because you've got some really incredible photographs um, up on your site that all of this, you know, the, the people that have been investigating it for so long are going to be able to step back and go, you know what, check this out. You know, I was right and we were right. And now here you go. Now we have to seriously take a look at this. The dog man, wolf man, uh, 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 Bigfoot. It's been talked about for a thousand years. This is not something new. But but here we are today where the sightings are becoming more and more frequent. It seems like maybe a portal or something is now opened more and more often, and they're coming into our world and visiting us. Right. And maybe, uh, you know, the, the membrane worldwide is becoming thinner and thinner, and we're going to see more and more interaction with a, a dimension that we can't really even imagine right now. Uh, t yeah, let's talk about some of these photographs that you have here uh, when it comes to uh, this half man, half dog uh, creature. Uh, you've got footprints in the snow, which are pretty insane. Uh, you've got this shot of what appears to be a, an upright walking canine right out in the middle of this field. Uh, what are we looking at here? Uh, yeah, that's a collection of, of evidence um, from our Dogman investigation, which is ongoing. Um, it's been many, many years of, of very credible people reporting these sightings. Uh, what's interesting is that when you, you look at the Bigfoot phenomenon, what's compelling about it is that you have a very long running oral history among the indigenous people that they're real. You've got a, a huge body of very, very credible witnesses. Um, then you have physical evidence being left. Well, the exact same thing is present in the dog man phenomenon. Um, Indian tribes who talk about them, um, you have physical evidence being left in, in the form of footprints and, and other things. And um, you have a very, very highly credible witnesses who come forward with nothing to gain, want no recognition, um, who make major life changes because of their encounter. Those are people that are, are highly credible. What is 
who is Dogman? Well, we don't really know who Dogman is. We're still trying to figure out, um, you know, as in Bigfoot, we believe we have a biological explanation for its existence. It's really difficult to come up with a biological explanation for an upright walking uh, dog. Um, what we do have is a long running Native American history, including the Aztecs, who may have actually originated in Wisconsin, believe it or not, um, worshiping uh, these entities. One of them was named Zolotl, and it was a dog headed man like figure. Um, of many of them have stories of, of shapeshifters and were creatures where, you know, these are people that apparently can shift into the shape and run upright. But in the footprint evidence, what we're seeing is um, an elongation of the part of the foot on the dog that comes, you know, just after the paw. It's usually up off of the ground. And in these prints, it looks like that's somehow been pushed down in order to support the weight of this thing running upright. And so we don't know if we're looking at uh, some sort of strange evolutionary leap by which our science just simply can't explain at this time, or we don't know if these indigenous people actually came across these creatures and began to deify them, or if somehow they invented these creatures and through a particular kind of worship brought them into manifestation in this reality. Well, I mean, these are all open, you know, scenarios. The the footprints in the snow clearly show three toes, but the two outer toes, the third toe is actually the short one. The two out it looks like a claw. A foot with with claws on the front. How big are these footprints? And I gotta tell you, these are they're pretty intimidating looking. They're pretty scary. Yeah, they really are. And and those were taken by a homesteader um, in a very, very rural area right after a fresh snow. And I can tell you it, it really put the fear of God into them when they came across them. Um, but from our analysis of the prints, it, it appears as though it was two creatures actually jogging side by side. And uh, you can tell by the stride between the prints that they were pretty large. And upright and two legs, right? Pretty creepy. I mean, yeah. it, it, that that first print, the one that's in the front, it looks, man, I almost want to say satanic. You know, it looks evil. It it doesn't look nice. It, that's not something I would want to run into in the dark. Yeah, not many dogman encounters are very nice. It's, it's not something that's going to run up and let you pet its head, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, and, and we're going to talk about that when we come back. And some of your footage and, and images that you took yourself, uh, I want to talk about those and, and go through some of these images. They're absolutely incredible. Our guest tonight, Jack Carey, Paranormal Investigation Agency. This is Fade to Black. More with Jack after the break. Stay with us. Here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRA Radio.com. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Hey there, quick question for you. Would you be okay with more energy, more endurance, thicker, healthier hair, a better mood, reduced appearance of wrinkles, improved sleep, improved blood pressure and cholesterol profiles, improved vision, improved memory? Okay then. Well now, have you heard of Nature's Youth RSF? It's from the anti-aging experts at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. See, at Nature's Youth, they understand exactly what it means to provide top quality health products. And Nature's Youth customers not only improve their health, they know they're also providing their body with the right nourishment to maintain that peak performance and fight the aging process. If health, wellness, and nutrition are what you desire, choose Nature's Youth RSF. I did. You see, you're going to get older. It's just up to you how you feel when you get there. Get started today. Nature's Youth RSF. 
Simple to use, simple to order. Go to naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. I was introduced to this remarkable product, Balance of Nature Fruits and Veggies, and to say it's amazing is an understatement. Balance of Nature provides the nutrients of 9 to 11 servings of 31 different whole ripened fruits and veggies per day, and the cost to the consumer for 9 to 11 servings is about 22 cents per serving, as opposed to over a dollar in the store. Balance of Nature Fruits and Veggies helps boost the immune system by over 720%, and they also provide a health coach for you at no charge to guide you with any questions you may have. And you can also visit their website for testimonials on balanceofnature.com. So take steps to give yourself better overall health and call them now, toll free, at 800-246-8751. That's 800-246-8751 or go to balanceofnature.com right now. Make sure to let them know you heard it here by using promo code TALK for a special discount. That's balanceofnature.com and use promo code TALK. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Jack Carey, the Paranormal Investigation Agency with J.C. Johnson. So we're going through his stuff. You can go to, just click on their page. It's right there at jimmychurchradio.com uh, for their website. And we're on the main page right now. And just scroll down and you can see the uh, the photographs and, and some of the video that we've been discussing on the show. Um, I want to talk about Bigfoot a little bit here, um, and well, I think Dogman is related, but you've also captured some some pretty compelling video of of Bigfoot and Dogman. Um, what do you think ultimately is is happening with Bigfoot? My thing is we haven't we don't have a we don't have a body, we don't have a carcass. Nothing's been hit by a car. Nothing's been shot and killed. Uh, nothing definitive out there, but we've got some pretty good eyewitness testimony, some incredible video. Uh, what do you think is going on? Well, you know, and we have, we've also got some really good DNA, um, and I'll get into to why that's also a problem, but, uh, to, to recount a particular tale, we, uh, took an expedition into the Chusca mountains, uh, Northern New Mexico, um, and we had gotten two separate calls from uh, Navajos on the Navajo reservation there in northern New Mexico. And they, they didn't know each other, and they were separated by 80 miles of terrain. And both of them reported seeing a Bigfoot, which they call Yaetso, um, leave DNA at the scene. And so, of course, we packed up and, and headed right over there. And the next day, we get there. And then the first location, and this creature had literally brushed up against this old uh, splintery shack that this, this guy had on his property. And it left thousands of, of hair strands. Um, we took Dr. Christopher Dyer, the executive director of the University of New Mexico, with us to, to watch the taking of the DNA sampling of the DNA so that it wouldn't be contaminated. Um, we collected DNA at that site and also discovered 16 inch footprints that were somewhere in the neighborhood of eight inches across at the ball of the foot, um, which, and they were three inches uh, in hard pan soil. So we, we collect all of the evidence at the first site and we immediately drive 80 miles to the, to the second site. And there's a group of Navajos who were cutting wood with chainsaws on a, on a one grove, side of a grove of trees. 
and they spooked one of these these creatures and it came running out the other side of the grove right into a navajo who was cutting wood with an axe and makes yet another directional turn and while it's looking over its shoulder at the navajo with the axe it runs right into a seven foot tree breaks it right in half left all kinds of fur hair and skin blood all over it we were able to retrieve that and all of that went into um, a, a second genome study first genome study was done by dr melba ketchum with over a hundred samples now the problem with uh, both genome studies, even though they were completely corroborative of one another, the, the findings were exactly the same, um, is that they have D human DNA and uh, they have it on their the mitochondrial side, which is the mother's lineage. And what the genome showed was that approximately 12 to 15,000 years ago, during what is called the Younger Dryas period, a period when a comet had hit the Earth, these there was an upright walking hominid species that we have not documented yet because we haven't found the ancient bones of it right but this right. this species apparently interbred with archaic human females now when you have a megafaunal extinction taking place from a cometary impact um, species that have very similar genetic makeups will tend to breed with one another out of uh, just an innate instinct of survival right and that's kind of what it looks like happened here. So we get the DNA, and it's been sent off to world-class geneticists to test it. And they come back and they say, this is contaminated. And we're like, what do you mean it's contaminated? We've got video documentation of us taking it. It couldn't possibly be. And they say, well, it's got human DNA. And so we go round and round. They keep telling us it's, it's contaminated because it has human DNA, and we keep telling them it has human DNA because they're part human. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's been quite a, 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 you know, a path down this whole thing of trying to actually prove it. Now, what we also know is that these creatures are, uh, because of their human DNA, extremely intelligent. And you're talking about a creature that not only has a human-like intelligence, but superhuman physical abilities. A creature that can literally see you from three miles away, smell you from two miles away, hear you from a mile away. And if a creature like that doesn't want to be seen, you're not going to see it. What was the other half of the DNA? That's the other half, which is the father's lineage, is this, it came back, unknown hominid species, meaning that there, there had to have been a, a hominid species, you know, walking around at that time. And it was that that interbred with archaic human females to create the line that we call Bigfoot today. The, the both DNA samples, 80 miles apart, but were they identical? They were identical. In fact, even the hair morphology um, was identical. Um, and that matched the, the 100 sample genome previously conducted by Ketchum and the Adrian Erickson group. And, uh, you know, they published the results of that. And then all of a sudden they're questioning uh, Dr. Ketchum's results because it came back with human DNA. Well, that matches another blind genome study perfectly. And they still don't like the results because it's just so difficult for them to swallow the truth that these things are in fact part human. Why isn't this the biggest news in anthropology? Why isn't this on CNN, you know, MSNBC? Well, you know that the day the Adrian Erickson group released their results of which JC Johnson was an integral member um, and people should check out the Crypto Four Corners YouTube channel because that's really the cryptozoology side of our investigations. Right. But, um, but when you, you you can just go to Google ABC Bigfoot is real and it'll pull up these amazingly good um, coverage and mainstream media of the results of the DNA with the high definition <laughs> video of a creature that w they were calling Matilda at the time. Um, and they just knew this is it. We got it. We got the DNA. We got discovery. We got high def video. We got it all. And they ran it on a every single major media, huge all day long that day. And the next day you could hear crickets. I mean, literally not one little blurb about it. 
And I think it's just because it's so, it's such a big, hard thing for human society to, to, to deal with. Now, you've got a, an embedded academia of people who have bet their entire careers that a creature like this can exist and uh, who are very resistant um, to us proving that it's real. But we're very, very close to doing just that. The shot, I want to know what was what was going on. The, the shot that you have of the dog man that's uh, posted on your uh, the, your homepage, right right there in the front of the site. Uh, tell me about this image. What, uh, oh, I've got a hundred questions. What did you see? What did you hear? How did you grab it? And, and so forth. What, tell us, uh, what's the background on this shot? Well, in that particular shot, one of the main things that we specialize in is in uh, in-depth video analysis of, of films. And in this particular shot, a, c- a couple of investigators had actually gone out from what's called the Rocky Mountain Sasquatch Organization, a fantastic organization. And they were simply responding to this area because there had been a, a Bigfoot sighting in the general area. And they had taken uh, some some film footage, approximately, I believe, five minutes of footage. Um, and way, way off in the distance is, is this black spot that just doesn't look right. And the gentleman tries to zoom in on it, but can't quite get his camera to focus just because of the quality of the camera. And we were able late to uh, take that film and, and later analyze it. Um, there was something just strange about that spot. And we looked at it frame by frame by frame and blew up each frame 800%. And lo and behold, this dog-headed, wolf-like creature with upright standing ears um, who looks like it's on two legs um, and a forearm that's in front of two huge pectoral muscles blocking out the foliage. And what we were able to actually capture about 10 frames where this thing even lifts its nose up and sniffs the air, and it's looking in the direction of the cameraman. The spooky thing about it is that the cameraman never even knew that they were being watched by this creature. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty crazy looking. I mean, I, I hate to use stupid words like that, but it's very, very hard to uh, to explain. Uh, and now going back, going down, you've got this shot. We posted it up on Twitter. That's uh, uh, clearly um, Sasquatch, and it looks like he's scratching his head, right, or scratching his his forehead. Where where did this come from? Uh, are you on the cryptozoology? Yeah, I'm, I'm on the main page. Yeah, the main page. It's actually not. If you look at that picture and then look at the, uh, the the further filtered picture on the cryptozoology page, you'll see what happens when you actually clean up the filter and are able to take away a little bit of the foliage. And what you're looking at is a field photograph of a Sasquatch um, taken in, in North Carolina. And, you know, again, this was something where we were analyzing a film frame by frame by frame and blowing each up, you know, a thousand percent. And all of a sudden this face pops out and we began to run that through a few filters. And what we ended up finding was a a face that's truly, truly shocking. It is um, it looks just like what the genome study is predicting. It look like the upper part has a cone head, very ape like sort of neanderthalish bone structure and then uh, below looks very human like and uh, again the 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 person filming this film had absolutely no clue that they were being watched by this creature now the next shot i want to discuss is this footprint it's uh 16 inches um you took this photograph so i'm assuming that this is part of your personal investigation and you were there absolutely yeah we found uh, a number of them actually at that location they were gigantic you know at the time and you're in the middle of nowhere you know 150 miles from the nearest building and you come across a, a a a track line of 16 inch footprints that either had to be shaquille o'neal out there walking around Um, You know, huge six-foot strides in between each pattern. Um, It's amazing when you come across that kind of evidence. How fresh were these? 
you know, that we don't know because we're not sure of the weight of the animal, but they were about three inches deep in hard pan soil. Um, because there's also grass here, which means, you know, there was no rain recently. You can tell that everything is still pretty fresh like this. Right. Or, you know, probably a day. I mean, they were very, very clear, fresh prints. There was hardly any deterioration. And out there, the wind will deteriorate a print really, really quickly. Yeah, so. that's right. That's right. Now, if these are 16 inches long. Now, they look like, especially at the top, uh, uh, where, you know, the toes, the front part of the foot, it's got to be eight inches across. It is, yeah. yeah should... well, well, well beyond the span of what could be a human, a normal human anyway. Now, when you take, you know, you're taking pictures, and these are obviously fresh, do you think that you were being watched? You know, I mean, quite quite possibly, you were very, very, very close to Bigfoot, or maybe even where they lived. Oh, yeah, quite possibly. And you know what? The excitement of the moment usually takes over when you find that kind of evidence. And, and you're hoping at that stage that you're being watched. Like, you know, you can just feel how close you are. And um, those are the moments that we sort of live for because, you know, ultimately we want to bring these mysteries to a, to a full resolution. We want the public to have to face the reality of what these things are so that we can then get about rewriting our history in a truthful manner, um, get about asking questions about our scientific method and how it is that a creature like this can exist right under our noses and our mainstream scientists don't even know about it. That's a real problem. And it's a, it's a problem that our society doesn't really want to want to face. Did you take cast? Oh, yeah, we take foot castings all the time. Now, how many, because once you get the cast, now you can really start to see the detail because you see it in the positive, not the negative. Um, how many toes? Uh, there's always five toes on, on a Sasquatch print. It looks very, very human. But what's interesting is in the Dogman prints, there's always exactly three toes. For some reason, these things have evolved to have a three-toed print that we can't quite figure out. Have you been able to, uh, yeah, I want to jump over to Dogman really quick. Have you been able to get Dogman prints in dirt, in mud? Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. They've been discovered. And, you know, one of the main patterns um, in Dogman sightings is uh, the presence of water, uh, the presence of cornfields, and the presence of Indian burial mounds. And in a good 90% of the sightings that come in, if you look geographically, you will find those three elements present. And uh, JC and I investigated a dogman case in Lakewood, Colorado, that's known as the Lakewood Lichen today. And in this particular case, we discovered that even though this was an affluent neighborhood, um, on the very outer boundaries of Denver, right behind it, were a number of what are called green belts, and these green belts are very wide wildlife refuge areas that stretch all the way from the city into the mountains. And they were built so that wildlife could travel them up and down. And we came to discover that this thing was traveling through this green belt right up to the back of this gentleman's house. Now, he described, and we, we've got his witness uh, drawing um, of the creature on the side, but he described an upright walking wolf that took two steps and was able to make it over a 12 foot wall in a single bound. Um, he, and this was 3 a.m. 3 in the morning while he was taking his little dog outside. And it really, really scared this gentleman. Um, he did not want any recognition. Normally with Crypto Four Corners, we always uh, film a YouTube video so that people can see the evidence for themselves. Uh, he, he refused to appear on film. Um, didn't want his name to be reported in the actual report that we published, and, and of course we didn't, but this wasn't somebody looking for any recognition. In fact, he was very, very scared and reached out to us. I'm looking at the 19-inch uh, footprint. This is stupid nuts, Jack. Th right. This... <laughs> okay. Is, and, and that... that that particular track line went on for a quarter of a mile. Were they, I, I mean, were they this um, uh, perfect? 
Pretty much, they were that perfect. What was interesting about this track line was that, uh, you know, we measure the stride in between every single print, and this thing was just apparently casually walking along because it's got about a six foot stride in between, and all of a sudden it goes to eight, and then to nine, and then to about ten and a half. And so this thing went from casually strolling through a field, you know, hundreds of miles from anybody, right. to taking uh, taking off in a dead sprint. And it, it was very perplexing to us what would scare a Sasquatch of that size. Well, maybe so, he was chasing like a deer. You yeah. know, do you ever see like deer prints, you know, with these where obviously it, something is about to meet an end? You, you know what I mean? He's chasing a meal, maybe. Yeah, it could have been a meal because they do feed off of deer and elk. That's their number one uh, food. And we've, we've found huge bone piles um, where they will drag their prey back to a location and eat it there. And they'll make a huge bone pile over time. Now I'm looking, okay, so this is 19 inches and clearly the best toe prints I have seen in quite a long time. Those toe print, that's a 19 inch print. That means that's like 12 inches across the top, 10 inches, 12 inches. It's, it, it's huge. Yeah, he had to be 10, 10, 12 feet tall. This guy was a monster. Oh, man, that is the craziest print. Are are you ever intimidated? Are, do you ever get scared? I mean, you see something like this, there's something out there a lot bigger than you. Oh, yeah. You, you know, it's a, with an animal like that, there's always a danger that maybe something's going, going to happen. We've discovered that the, the species is fairly docile. I mean, every once in a while they... Um, have thrown rocks at us and made a lot of screaming noises and things like that. But we also go out pretty heavily armed just in case, you know, for the safety of our crew if something were to happen. Um, but in the end, we're looking just to, to prove their existence and, and not really kill one because they have human DNA after all. Um, we're hoping that one day we'll come across those, the remains that we need so desperately in order uh, that the world scientists can now walk up to a fleshy body, pull DNA off of it, test it, and then say, see, now this belongs to that, because that's the one element that's missing. Uh, I've just posted this 19-inch print. It's up in Twitter. If, you, if you're not on Twitter, just go to the homepage right there for PIA uh, through the website. Scroll to the bottom of the page. It's right there. On the bottom of the homepage. That is a pretty crazy shot, my friend. Yeah, it really is. And shocking to see how just how long the track line was. You know, lots of times you'll come across a print or two, but to, to have one that goes for a quarter of a mile is extremely rare. Now, there's been a lot of reports about dogman attacks uh, and things that, uh, you know, some direct human contact. What about Bigfoot? Uh, there's been, you know, any Bigfoot attacks out there? Yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of stories and anecdotal evidence that if you go into a particular area and they want you gone and you don't leave, you could, you could possibly be in some danger. Um, and Dogman, it's this. Usually, it's just a ferocious um, encounter every single time. Um, so. Yeah, in both cases, there have been accounts of people being both killed and injured. The um, Somebody just posted, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Last week, there was a report out of Idaho. There was a car crash that a lady had, and she said and she hit a deer, and she blamed it on Bigfoot. Did you see this report? I, I did see that report, and you know what it drew my attention to was a report that we had received a long, long time ago of a gentleman who was driving in a in a wooded area and noticed a couple of deer running up the embankment right at his truck and run right in front of his truck up into the other side of the woods that was also um, you know going up in elevation, and all of a sudden he said these things turned and ran right back down the embankment and he looked in both directions and there was a sasquatch in either direction so one of them was flushing these animals to the other and they happened to flush it right in front of his truck 
And then we have this lady's account of pretty much the same thing happening. What she probably didn't see were the other two animals on the other side of the road that the deer was supposed to run into. Oh, they are, they are. yes, 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 yes. I got you. But she was looking in her rear view mirror and then looked over her shoulder. Had she looked to her left, right. she would have seen, wow, yeah, yeah. They are that smart, aren't they? Oh, yeah, they're pack hunting. And it, from a number of eyewitnesses, we're beginning to, to ascertain that they also have a, a tribal culture. Um, these are creatures that do something with their dead. People want to know why we can't find the remains because this isn't a gorilla. This is something that literally uh, does something with its dead. Now, whether they're burying them or whether they are consuming them as a form of ancestor worship, like was practiced in a number of ancient cultures, we really don't know. But um, these aren't just dumb creatures. They revere their dead, and they live in family units of four to five, and they pack haunt and... Um, we're beginning to see all of the elements of a rudimentary ancient civilization of, of people that are part human and yet have chosen the path they're on. They want nothing to do with us. It, um, it, 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 and, you know, it's also it, w with Dogman, a uh, little bit with Sasquatch, but these half human, half animal creatures it goes all the way back to ancient Egypt, right? That This is something that has always been talked about. And th I think it's it's connected. I think that there is something there. Let me ask you this before we hit to the break, and I want to discuss this after the break. What about wings? What about flying versions of this? Uh, again, reported on a lot. Uh, what do you see in the four corners? Uh, well, one of the flying creatures that was investigated by Crypto, Crypto Four Corners is the so-called uh, Night Stalker case. And in this particular case, uh, a creature kept landing in a family's cornfield, leaving gigantic footprints um, that were also three-toed. And it began to get closer and closer to their actual family structures, which was beginning to scare them a lot. And one night, this family um, happened to actually see the creature, and they reported to us that it had the face of a gargoyle. Now, these were being reported by rural indigenous Navajo people who are very, very rarely ever lie to you. They just don't have a reason to. <laughs> you know, there's nothing in it for them at all. In fact, they're looking for help in one of, in these cases. And um, they had a little one of their little girls sleeping in the bedroom of the trailer. This thing literally ripped the air conditioning unit off the wall trying to get to her. So, yeah, there's some scary, scary stuff out there. Ah, red eyes. Yeah, red eyes, and they said the only thing they could tell us was gargoyle. Gargoyle, this thing looked to them just like a, a, a gargoyle. Um, you know, maybe it matched Mothman sightings. Maybe this was one right. of the same yeah. species of those things. But going back to, to ancient Egypt and Samaria, clearly there are descriptions in a lot of those tablets of some type of, of genetic manipulation happening uh, with alien presence on our planet. And JC and I both believe that some of the creatures that we see um, that would be considered cryptozoological are, in fact, survivors um, of this genetic manipulation that went on. Let's take a break right here, Jack. Fantastic conversation. Unbelievable. The photographs that we're talking about and the images are over on Jack's website. You can get there. Just click on the website at jimmychurchradio.com. It'll take you straight there. More with Jack Carey after this break. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal Guard, on jimmychurchradio.com. KGRA Radio. Intelligent Talk. Do you know what's in your body soap? Well, I didn't know the answer until about five years ago when I looked at the label of my soap and was shocked to see all the chemicals. For my entire life, I had been assaulting the largest organ of my body, my skin, and to think my children were using it too. 
Well, a lot has changed since then. Today, my family and I operate Stone City Farms, where we make and sell all natural goat milk soap using fresh goat milk from goats we raise on our farm. Our mission at Stone City Farm is to produce high quality, all natural goat milk soap for people who want a fresh, unrefined natural product. At Stone City Farms, we offer scented and unscented soaps and a signature line of gift sets customizable to your needs. To see what our customers are saying, go to stonecityfarm.com. Use the code natural for a 20% discount. That's stonecityfarm.com, code natural for 20% off your order. You never know what could be hiding in your soap. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on the smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Would you like relief from muscle pain, headaches, and discomfort to sleep better, have more energy during the day, and just feel naturally amazing? Fibromalic can help. Its blend of malic acid and magnesium can provide pain relief and comfort for those who experience fibromyalgia. It helps your body absorb more oxygen, and it works quickly for a significant reduction in pain within 48 hours, all without a prescription. Ask for Fibromalic at health and vitamin shops or shop Fibromalic.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. secret i love ponies i really love ponies i'm serious i couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush why fade to black because you never got that pony damn it this is fade to black with jimmy church on the game changer radio network and kgra the global radio alliance Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'm going to open up the phone lines, especially if you live in the Four Corners area. Give us a call, 323-825-5045, 323-825-5045. Jack, I'm, I want to stay on, I, I normally don't do this, but I'm fascinated with your research here with you and JC, and I'm on the crypto page. And I, I, I just want to, I want to go through this. I want to know what we're looking at. You've got a lot of different uh, uh, areas of investigation here. Um, the first photograph at the top of the page is your analysis of this video, which is called, uh, is this the clearest photo of a Bigfoot since the Patterson Gimlin film? And this is pretty nuts. That I, yeah. I, okay, so what are we looking at here? Uh, well, that was the, the photo I was referring to, that um, you see the previous photo of the, of the face in the foliage that looks green and camouflaged. This is it simply in a, in a different light spectrum. And uh, through that, you can see through the foliage and actually see the bone structure, the nose, the eyes, the cone head shaped of this, cre- of this creature. Right. And we, we literally had to blow it up about 800% um, uh, to get that face to come out. It's right there. Yeah. I mean, this, make- is, this isn't an illusion. This is clearly a creature in the woods. Oh, yeah. And the gentleman who uh, just by happenstance took that video, well, he's not a Bigfoot researcher. Uh, 
he was there actually filming a very, very short hike that he was going on, and it was very near a waterfall in North Carolina. And um, uh, it wasn't until he got home that he kind of noticed this little bit of a face-off in the distance and, and uh, sent it to us to examine it. And sure enough, when we uh, blew it up frame by frame, this face popped out, and then we just changed the, you know, the spectrum on it, and that kind of detail came out so well i've seen of- i've seen the video before right i've 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 and you could see in the distance right this this creature moving through um uh the the background but i've never right. seen it blown up like this and now that it's clearly wow hey, you know what even your your breakdown of it is one thing, but even just the full color shot, right? You know, uh-huh. in, in green, that dude, that is that's off the charts. Yeah, it's amazing, and you get to see in the, you know in the foliage shot with the green just how well camouflaged these creatures are. Um, a lot of them have somewhat tr- translucent hair, and that allows. Um, light to kind of pass through at different angles and they sort of take on the color of the foliage around them when they're sitting there. So now let's, let's, uh, let's, let's go off the, let's go off the rails a little bit about the Hobbit species living in Minnesota. Yes. Um, an amazing photograph that was taken in the field by the crypto four corners crew. They're investigating what are known as the Bagwanini, um, which is a hobbit species said to exist in Minnesota. Now, the the Native American people there, again, because we listen to their legends, um, were telling us that these creatures do, in fact, exist and that they had seen them on a number of occasions. And we responded to an area where they were supposed to exist. And it wasn't until later that we our photo expert in our group actually noticed this little guy um standing out and looking at us <laughs> and uh yeah a lot of my research um end of of that investigation is linking that to the homo florensiensis hobbit species that was recently discovered in indonesia now what we have are two examples of of a hobbit species one of them proven by science the other not yet we're hoping to do just that and both having a a very close resemblances um uh both of them linked to ancient oral histories of their existence um and we believe that it could very well be that this is an offshoot of the hobbit species that was found in and even in indonesia that they once may have been all over the place this is nuts i know this is nuts um uh, just peeking up through through the foliage. I yep. uh, taking, a, taking a good look at us. <laughs> this is crazy. Where, where, did you guys hear anything? Um, no, they didn't hear anything at the time at all. In fact, that photograph they didn't. It wasn't even intentional. It wasn't until our photographic expert. Um, in the group was looking through all of the photos that she noticed something very strange. Um, you know, she runs everything through her, her, uh, photo software and examines it, everything in extreme detail, even pictures that we wouldn't think have anything in them. Um, she can eventually pick out some evidence that's valuable to us. And in this particular case, she got this, this little guy staring right up at us. What, what are the reports coming out of Minnesota? Are these little guys seen often? Yeah. Well, and they're the scary thing about them is they're linked, um, uh, especially in native American lore to missing people in the woods. Um, so even recently there was a, a missing person case in the last few years that the indigenous people there were blaming on the Bagwanini. The, uh, the reports that we've had, uh, uh, when we talk about cryptozoology pretty documented and the Mothman case is the one that we always look towards, but there is something there in these winged creatures and it goes all the way back to Bigelow and Skinwalker. Um, I, do you think that Mothman is what was, be, you know, been talked about with the Native American tribes and Skinwalker? And is there a connection there? Or do you think that 
uh, Mothman is something else that may be more demonic and, and interdimensional and, and not related to what has been cited out at Skinwalker. Yeah, I think I, exa- the latter to be the case exactly is that, uh, you know, it's sort of my belief that in the Mothman case, what they were seeing might have been what's referred to as one of the Nephilim, one of the uh, the surviving so-called fallen angels um, on the earth. I mean, this thing had the ability to project uh, messages into people's minds. It had this uh, ability, as in the Mothman prophecies, to kind of show up where um, disasters always occurred, um, seemed to have the ability to tell the future. Um, and what's interesting is that in the real accounting of, of what happened with Mothman, a lot of the activity was based around UFO activity. So. Um, when you go back and read the actual account of the Mothman prophecies and what was actually going on around there, it was UFOs and dead animals, and the Mothman sort of played this peripheral role in all of this uh, tragedy that was taking place. Have you been to Skinwalker? No, I've not been there. In fact, most of these locations now, um, they're guarded not only by United States Army but they have signs posted saying this is a United States installation. <laughs> and and uh, it's almost as though the government knows about these portals um, where the, the rips and these membranes occur, and they're beginning to post guards at each and every one of the doors because every time we have a, a, a place like this go up for sale, it's purchased by the U.S. government. Oh, these shots, as I continue down, everybody just go to the Cryptozoology Files uh, page at uh, PIA. Very simple. Um, and, and scroll down to the bottom. I almost want to talk about uh, 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 the, the werewolf section. Um, but I'm moving on and continuing down because there's some more video analysis here of, uh, of, 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 a, of a face. Um, is this video, man, this is, this, this is pretty crazy. Um, it's the, a Bigfoot, the Lost Creek, uh, the Lost Creek, uh, video stuff. Did you shoot this? Who shot this? Yeah, that's actually a, our blow up picture of the dog man, um, discovered there in, in Lost Creek. And that's, that was the, uh, Rocky Mountain Sasquatch organization field researchers that had gone out to this field and, uh, they were just, you know, responding to get some b-reel basically some some field footage of this area where a a previous bigfoot report had occurred and in this particular case um they actually came across a dog man that they didn't even know was watching them the whole time when we analyzed the film it was just amazing to see that face pop out with the wolf snout and we got like 10 frames where it it literally lifts its nose up in the air and sniffs the air like it's sniffing these guys out in the field with uh, your infrared stuff that you guys are doing now with uh, the heat signatures have you been able to capture something uh, definitive with that technology to to go back and analyze? Not definitive yet, but we're making new efforts, basically, in that regard in the use of um, uh, future use of drones that are going to also have thermal technology on them that are extremely um, high technology. So we're hoping that any any kind of physical creature on the ground at all, when we show up to one of these hotspots, is going to be detected immediately. And what that's going to allow us to do is not waste time in a particular area where where we can easily determine that the creature is, is or not there. Did you see it surfaced, I saw it about a month ago, the drone footage of of Bigfoot that is is running through this this prairie and then into the woods. Have you seen that? Um, well, I've seen a video very similar to that. Whether or not it's the same one, I'm not quite sure. But is it the one that's just got the huge muscular back? And I mean, it look it looks like a gorilla running through the woods. I mean, this thing really was moving. No, I haven't. I no. The one that I'm referring to. The drone is probably a thousand feet or more in the air. It's, it's oh yeah, 
Yeah, I did actually see that. And and Bigfoot is just a little speck on the screen, right? And it's it's yeah. running, and then it runs into the trees. Right. Clearly, it's, it's clearly naked um, and and black or you know dark brown, and it's running. It's up on two feet. It's not human, whatever it is. Um, I don't, do you think when you look at something like that, is it possible that a bear could run on two feet for a hundred yards? You know, I, sure it's possible. Um, bears run upright all the time. It's just, uh, if you, if, you know, they run upright, but it's not pretty to look at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we, it, the reason why I ask that is because uh, clearly to me, when I saw that video, it's not a human running, right? It's it's too funky. It 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 just doesn't look right. Um, but so then you have to go to the next step, right? Okay, so it's not human. So what could be running on 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 two legs like that? That that isn't human. That's covered in fur. Well, okay, we've got bears. That's possible. We have Bigfoot, right? That's possible. I don't know what I'm looking at in this video, but I don't think that I'm looking at a human because it's just not even a human couldn't fake it. Is is right. way you know it's not a dude in a in a monkey suit. There's something else going on here. Yeah, not only that, you know, if you're going to uh, conduct a hoax of that nature, um, almost every hoax that ends up being a hoax. They always have to have that one money shot, that one shot that's got just a few frames that are that really sell you. And in that particular film, it, you know, it, it would be ridiculous for somebody to dress up in a monkey suit and be a thousand feet away from a drone trying to perpetrate a hoax like that because automatically people are going to question, you know. What, what you, is that? What kind of a creature could that be? And now I want your um, I want your opinion on the Patterson film. Um, what do you think? Authentic? Absolutely authentic. And uh, the interesting thing about the skeptics with the Patterson film who say this was a man in a monkey suit never take into account the year in which that film was taken. That's right. And 1967, the, the, the best quality um, Hollywood makeup going on was on the, the sets of, of Planet of the Apes. And these two cowboys, without any money, come up with a monkey suit that Hollywood can't even produce. And, you know, that's a, an amazing argument to me for people to be making. Um, the other thing is that when you do a frame by frame analysis on that creature, you, you can do a, a measuring of the arm length, which has uh, been done even by a number of scientists. And that arm length is well beyond the arm length of, of any human ratio. And in one of the frames, the creature literally squeezes its fist. Now, this was a, a time in Hollywood when the, that kind of technology and animatronics didn't even exist. Um, they would have dreamt uh, of having something like that. Well, I like the yeah, I like your analysis there because I've said the exact same thing. Not only did we have, you know, what was considered the best in Hollywood at the time with Planet of the Apes, but we had Stanley Kubrick doing his shots for 2001 A Space Odyssey for 1968 and his guerrilla sequences at the, at the very beginning of the film. And Stanley doesn't play around. I, he wanted to make sure that that was absolutely as realistic as possible. And as, as, as great as it was and the lengths that he took to make sure that we were convinced about what we were seeing on the screen, it still looked like monkey suits. Okay, that's <laughs> clearly look. And when you look at the Patterson film, I don't see that. I I I don't see a suit I, in in any context. I I just don't see it. it. Doesn't feel that way. And I am totally convinced that that is an actual uh, piece of footage of of Bigfoot. Oh, I am too. And a lot of people. Another skeptical point is why doesn't it run away? It just walks away. Well. If you examine the film even further uh, and look at the right thigh of the creature, you'll see an enormous gash. This creature had a, a major injury and was still able to pick itself up and walk away with that kind of fluidity. Um, but that was the reason it was walking and not running. When we, What I always say about ufology, Jack, and I really mean this, if ufology 
had a piece of footage of a UFO, right? Like the Sasquatch Bigfoot community has the Patterson film. It would be case closed. Right. The uh, uh, when we talk about ufology, can you think of what's the best example that we have, like the Patterson film? What's the best example that we have in ufology of a Patterson film? Well, you, in my mind, one of the best would be the the Phoenix Lights and what what occurred that night. Um, even the former governor uh, of the state at that time has come forward and and told people about his personal encounter of seeing what he saw. And, um, you know, that was a very, very impressive display. There's no way that those were flares. Um, so many people were able to document it. Um, this was, So many people saw what they believed to be a craft that couldn't possibly have been made on uh, on the earth, a uh, vast mile, mile large. Um, and when you have something like that, that sort of is a Patterson Gimlin film. You've got multiple angles of the phenomenon, um, from all over the city, a hundred different videos. And it's, it's actually quite, quite compelling that that was an extra extraterrestrial presence, um, that night in Phoenix. How, how often do you guys get uh, reports about abductions? You know, not that often, surprisingly. Um, I can tell you that video footage does exist, um, which we have a link to. Now, the link we have is to some of the poor quality remnants of this video, but I can tell you that this video does depict a very real alien abduction taking place. And it's at a couple's home. They're in bed asleep, and you get to see what actually happens and the kind of technology that it would take in order for it to happen. They had a camera set up. She was having these experiences, and so they set up a camera to record her sleep patterns. And uh, what happens in that film is that she literally dematerializes in the bed for over 30 minutes. It's gone and then spontaneously rematerializes almost as though she got beamed up and beamed back down this is a couple that didn't have um, the kind of financial means necessary in order to try to pull off a hoax like that we could tell that the the camera and the video footage was not tampered with so it's it's quite a quite a video to watch shot in 2010 it's a uh, time stamped Jack? Yes. Yeah, I said it, it's shot in 2010 and it's time stamped. Right. Yeah, um, I remember seeing this video now. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty interesting. That's right. And 30 minutes goes by and then she comes back. Right. Uh, um, when it comes to abductions, uh, I think that these experiences are real, but if you're going to investigate this like a, uh, an agency, uh, how would you approach it? Do you think that some some could possibly be staged? You know, could it be the government doing these abductions and making it look like it's ET? So we would come back and speak about this. Uh, absolutely, absolutely and and that's kind of why we exist so for example we, we get a an email into us and it's a compelling account of alien abduction somebody that that has the right facts um somebody that doesn't look like they're trying to perpetrate a hoax instead of contacting uh that person back we will simply descend upon that area um for a number of nights full surveillance to see if, in fact, anything occurs, and she then report, oh, I was abducted last night. Oh, wow, well, that's interesting, because we had three agents around that area, and it's, this is what they recorded. You see what I mean? Yes. Um, and that way, we remain completely pristine and outside of the situation, so that we're not susceptible to hoaxes uh, so much. But um, that was sort of the whole idea was to approach these, the, all of these different phenomenon in a way that an intelligence agency would really do it in order to tell if these people were, in fact, giving us the true story. What happened what, what, with this lady here with this abduction that was over in the U.K., 
Uh, right. What did she say? Where did she go? Does she have recollection about you know what happened while she was gone? Uh, we you know not during that particular abduction, as I recall, but she had a long running um, problem of it occurring to her, and lots of memories of of medical procedures and the usual uh, DNA samples being taken. Um, uh, pregnancies that are there and then just gone things like that yeah what's most fascinating is the end it's not so much the beginning the end of the video was pretty trippy yeah yeah man i don't know how to explain that if they're gonna hoax it i don't know i don't know how i don't know yeah that's uh that's a pretty disturbing video i haven't seen that in a while Uh, it is they they never saw the dime Uh, they didn't want to, to make any kind of money off of it. In fact, they were very embarrassed to even show it uh, to people. To yeah, well, yeah, I don't know if I'd be showing it. Uh, I want to thank you for coming on tonight. Uh, uh, what are you and JC working on now? Uh, well, we have a number of, of uh, different cases going on. He is currently still investigating both the Bagwanini in Minnesota, but also a property where there's a large amount of Sasquatch activity taking place almost on a nightly basis. And I'll be traveling up there pretty soon to join him in the field there. But we're also doing a dogman investigation here in central Oklahoma in a small little town called Konawa, where uh, some headstones were discovered dating back to 19, 1888 to 1907 that were inscribed, murdered by human wolves. Yes, well, I explain that really quick. <laughs> uh, they, uh, obviously, uh, everybody was asking about this on Twitter. Ex- explain this. Yeah, so this is a very small little town, and there was a private investigator here in Oklahoma who was told by a contact that she needed to go look at some headstones in this tiny little forgotten cemetery that, that there was a big mystery to it. And so she, she does, she goes down and she takes a look at it and she finds these headstones and they, they do say murdered by human wolves right on them. And, um, began a 25-year investigation into it and discovered actually that there were a a few um, old, old cemeteries that were kind of overgrown and everything that had headstones dating from those same time periods inscribed murdered by human wolves. What's fascinating is that we've got a long-running history all through that area of dogmen sightings. And uh, one of the eyewitnesses in the case reported um, that she in fact saw what appeared to be a, a, a naked man running on all fours uh, with an elongated dog-like face who was able to leap over this huge wall right in front of her. Really, really scared her. Yeah, these are these are uh, just crazy. And it does. It says right there, killed by human wolves. Right. All right. Um, now, there's. Uh, I, I want to thank you. What's the easiest way for everybody to get in touch with you and J.C.? Uh, you can get uh, get to both of us, uh, Facebook, Crypto Four Corners, um, for JC or I, or you can go to Facebook, Paranormal Intelligence Agency for us both. You can go to the Crypto Four Corners YouTube channel, which has a ton of videos of, of tons of cases with case evidence and eyewitnesses on them. They're fantastic to watch. And you can also log on to my site, which is the paranormalintelligenceagency.com, and um, you can contact us uh, through that site. Thank you so much, Jack. And there's something really crazy about this gravestone now uh, that you don't know about, Jack. So I've just posted this up. Now, and I have just said, what is crazy about this image? I'll send a cool prize to the first person to get it right. Now, take a look at the gravestone. It's staring at you. What is really cool about this? Jack, I'll tell you uh, I'll tell you right after. Uh, so you just stay right there. You're going to trip out when I tell you. Let's see, let's see who's a really smart fade or not. All right, Jack Carey, Paranormal Intelligence Agency. All of the links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. If you have anything in the four corners, anything that you want to report, anything that you need investigated, you want checked out, you got cool video, uh, great images, Jack is your guy. Thank you so much, Jack. Great conversation tonight. Say good night, Jack. Good night. And there you go. I'm going to put Jack on hold. It's fade to black. I'm keeping the phone lines open. 323-825-5045. I'll be right back. Vivica Fox here.
here and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Balance of Nature's Fruits and Veggies. I had gout in both my knees, and it's gone. Uh, well, I'm pretty stupid. I should have ordered it, like, you know, 15 years ago. Best really? thing I ever got in my... It's, it's the most effective product that I've ever bought in my life. He had eczema on his hand, and it cracked and it cracked for years. Mm-hmm. He did anything from doctor, every cream, everything. And three months on the veggies and fruit, mm-hmm. it was gone. They're just awesome. They keep asking me, what am I doing? I told them what I did with my cholesterol. I had the blood test, right? And it went down 100 points. 262, now it's 162. Everything is just perfect. Call now to find out how to get your free month supply of Balance of Nature. Call 800-2468-751. That's 800-2468-751. Call now, 800-2468-751. Or go online to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code TSL. Would odors, mold, and mildew describe your basement or crawl space? It doesn't have to be that way. Transform them into a fresh, healthy, usable one with the technologically advanced Wave Moisture Control Units. The computerized operation maximizes moisture control and also expels harmful radon, combustion gases, and numerous other pollutants. Dehumidifiers are old technology that do nothing for air quality and waste energy. Wave units are intelligent, self-monitoring, do not need maintenance, and will save you hundreds in electricity. Wave units are still running effectively effectively over 15 years. They've been tested and installed in public and military housing and by property managers nationwide. Buy a unit now and if your home is not fresher and drier, you can return it for a full refund for up to 12 months. What have you got to lose? Call now. 1-888-618-WAVE. 1-888-618-WAVE. Or visit MyDryHome.com. That's MyDryHome.com. Wave Home Solutions for a healthy, comfortable home. What's up, Fade or Nots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Tappy. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com Welcome back. Fade to Black. What a great show tonight. Jack Carey. Four Corners. Just check out his website. Now, look. the uh, All of the images that we discussed tonight, you can just go over there to PIA. Click on the links over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Uh, Paranormal Intelligence Agency. The links are right there. And you can just follow through uh, each specific page. We went through the, the UFO page and looked at some of those images. We looked at the current events page, uh, current investigations, and, of course, the cryptozoology page. Um, great images, great videos. Uh, the UFO page, that alien abduction caught on tape. I've seen that before. It's been a while. Um, and now that I look at it again, yeah, it's not the beginning. The beginning's cool. The beginning school. It's the ending of the video. That's uh, that's that's pretty hard to hoax. That's that's a pretty tough one to do. 
And uh, there you go. So everything that we discussed tonight is over on uh, the PIA website. Now, going back, uh, oh, the phone lines are open, 323-825-5045. If you're on hold, just stay right there, and I'll get to you in a second. The gravestone that I was talking about, the one that says killed by wolves, uh, Mark Tarana guessed it first. It's got my birth date on it right there, October 10th. Wow, there it is. Murdered by human wolves. Died on October 10th. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's that's pretty trippy. So, Mark, it looks like you get your hat, bro. All right, see, you had to earn it, but you just did. Yeah, man, I'll put a hat in the, in the mail to you. Okay, very cool. And uh, And nobody caught that. You know, I thought that uh, it would uh, load up here uh, pretty quickly, but Mark uh, was pretty fast on the draw. So congratulations, Mark. If you look, it's right there, October 10th. And I, I've been looking at the gravestone all day, and I didn't catch it until the <laughs> until the end of the show. All right, let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. This is Gabriel. Hey, Gabe. What are you doing, brah? I'm mean, sitting here freaking out with all the connections to Colorado, man. It's it was almost bugging me a little. Colorado's messed up. Colorado's cool. It's got. I guess. I guess I didn't realize it didn't just have just aliens. It has Bigfoot. It has Dogman. I mean, I figured it was just a chupacabra that I saw in the cornfield that one day. But right, it sounds right. more like it could have been a Dogman. I didn't know you saw chupacabra. You never told me this. What happened? Well, you know, it's one of those things you're not just going to go blabbing about because I didn't, I wasn't going to stop and take pictures of it because, you know, I was just driving home. But, um, you know, Sharika could definitely verify that I sent her a uh, voice message um, as soon as I saw it, just frantically, you know, a bunch of cuss words, of course. But I was just driving down a, a back road in between two cornfields because I live out in Sterling, Colorado, which is pretty much out in, you know, cow town or, or farm country. Right. Um, and... I was driving down this road. It's 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 a road where there's people that usually walk down it or are on it. So I don't I don't. It's not like I'm flying down it or anything. But I was going about 40 miles an hour, and I saw something that was like there's a drainage ditch on either side, and there it, it wasn't corn season. It was kind of like pre, probably right before corn season starts. So there's just kind of like sprouts. Right. But the grass in the ditch was still kind of high. And as I come up on this portion where I, I've i seen the, the farmer's equipment come in and out of, so it's like a little dirt path that goes off of the paved road and then into the field, gotcha. but then there's a ditch on either side of it. Right. So this thing's like poised to cross the street, and it, and it kind of dives back right as soon as I kind of come up this little crest right to this area. And it dives back, and I look over because I'm like, what is it, a dog? Because I'm worried it's going to cross, you know, do the, oh, oh, should I cross, should I cross? Right. And, but it's just sitting there crouched down. And I looked at it, man, and it, it, was, it was long snout and leathery-looking skin, like black, and just like these glaring eyes. And it had its, its paws or feet, like, like on the, the ground. Like it, it wasn't in the way that a dog would where the, where the feet would have been straight down. They, they were like perched almost like humans. Exactly. And I was just like, Whoa. So I immediately got on the phone and tried to call Shereen. I was like, I just saw like either a chupacabra or something crazy, man. Cause I, I, I swear it did not look like a dog. It was, it was poised to cross the street like a human would, or if I was crouched down in the ditch, ready to jump. How big? So, uh, the head, I would say easily, you know, great Dane size. I'm talking big enough to where I noticed it and was worried about it crossing the street. Cause I didn't want to hit it. Fangs. So, Did you see least, the teeth? At least that big. And the drainage ditches, I would say the drainage ditches can't be, they're not, I mean, I wouldn't say they're huge, but they're not any less than three feet deep. I mean, sometimes four or five feet deep. They're pretty big. So how big was he? I would say I I couldn't see much of the body, but I could see the shoulders and the head, and I would say at least five or six feet tall, at least. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm talking. It, it was it was pretty large because it, it, you could see it driving. It wasn't just like a dog on the side of the road where you might not catch the whole body, and it right, just kind of jumps right. off into the ditch into the trees. What about? But teeth? it was big enough to where it caught my attention. Teeth, teeth. I didn't see the mouth wasn't open. 
Okay. It was closed. It was it was it was trying to kind of hide away from me because I had my lights on bright because I usually turn my brights on because I'm worried about deers crossing the road around there. What time of day? Because deers are usually always. I'd say I usually get home. It was it was guaranteed. I usually get home about seven, and if it and if it wasn't growing season yet, which I'm pretty sure it wasn't, the the sun goes down quicker because daylight savings hadn't kicked yet. So it was probably sundown. And it was it was at least dark enough to where I had my brights on, not just regular lights. Let me get this. Let me. I want to want to know if I'm understanding you correctly. You're you're saying that what you saw was a five foot to six foot creature with a long snout with black leather skin, crouched down, ears perked up, ears perked up, and. That I don't even do. That's like frightening. That's like a, a real yeah. monster sighting. Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you what, because a couple of people I've told about it, their first reaction is always, "Well, did you stop and get out and check it?" I'm like, "Are you insane? Right, There's right. no way I was going to stop. <laughs> I kind of went faster." <laughs> oh. I mean, because the, what caught my eye was, I figured, I figured at first it was just a deer trying to cross the road because something had came you know, out of the ditch to go to cross. And then when I came up closer, it was like, oh, they're coming up. So they kind of backed away. And that's why I noticed it. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have seen if it was just crouched there. But I saw it crouch back into the drainage ditch to try and hide from me in the bushes a little bit. And I, like, looked over the steering wheel because I drive a bug. I don't know if you know kind of if you've ever driven in a bug, but you have the big front windshield. Right. So you can see pretty much right out of the front window. Right. And the side windows are pretty large open, too. So I'm, like, kind of looking over there like, what is that? And I had my brights on, like I said. So it's it's illuminating the whole ditch area. Did it, so, why, did, did it look at you as you drove past? It, it straightened my eyes, Jimmy. Oh, that, man. That's what was the most freaky part is it's looking right at me like I see you looking at me. I'm, you're looking at me. I see you. And I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa, okay. Wow. So that's what the freakiest part about it was. Yeah. Did he give you that look like, yeah, man, turn around. Come on back. <laughs> well, I dare yeah, I, you. I'll be honest. Like, I'm an empathic person, and I did. I felt the fear mode. <laughs> right. I felt like, oh, my God, this person saw me. And it was it was trying to hide and, and keep keep away because it didn't want to be seen. Yeah, you said it right. Your friends are going, oh, man, you know, did you get out? No, I didn't. And there's reasons why I stayed in the car and I kept going. I mean, I don't carry my gun with me at all times, but I mean, that's the only way I'd even think about getting out of the car is if I had a loaded pistol with me because there's no other way I'm getting out. Wow, that's a great sign. I, I'm, I, I'm a little guy, so I'll tell you what, some five, six-foot creature sitting in the ditch? No, 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 no way. I'm not stupid. Gabriel, thank you for the phone call, man. I'm I'm still wondering what you saw. That's incredible. Uh, me too. Thank me you. too, Jimmy. Have a good night, man. You too, man. Thank you. Gabe, I wonder what he saw. I mean, it sounds, ah, you know, you know, leather, black leather skin and a snout and that big right five to six feet tall wow let's go to the phones hi you're live on fade to black who's calling hey jimmy it's josh hey josh how are you hey uh i'm doing all right hey, i'm gonna tell you something freaky um well they uh the chupacabra they uh they, down south texas you, you they shoot them all the time down there they send texts uh, pictures. My son's got pictures of several of them, and they're they're about five feet. They're hairless. They got fangs. I mean, they're, they're like we have dobermans, and um, I mean, like the fangs come off the side. Just, I mean, long, long. It's crazy. Black, black leather skin, <laughs> like uh, what Gabriel was kind of, describing. Kind of black. Um, this is more. I've seen black and brown. Wow. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, this is something that I personally saw. And this is about six months after the, the big uh, to-do in Steamville. Yeah. Uh, we went out to this, uh, where this lady lived at, and she was uh, seeing UFO stuff. So we drove out there, and, <laughs> excuse me, um, we were driving, and we were out in the middle of the country, and, <laughs> 
We just happened to be right where this light was, and all of a sudden, this thing runs across the road. It's about probably about three feet, four feet tall. It looks like a mini T-Rex, you know. And I'm and when I just locked it up, and uh, we got the lights on it, and I'm like, you know, holy, you know, and uh. <laughs> And I'm saying, are you seeing that? And it's it's running across the road, and then all of a sudden it just leaps, and it's got wings, and it goes up. I thought I was going to jump into the tree, and he goes plumb over the tree and just into the darkness. Wow. And uh, uh, But I I asked about it, and I I found out that um, out there in that area, and it's going towards Brownwood, um, that there's a... ponds out there, the circular ponds, there's three of them, and they're owned by the government, and, you know, I don't I don't know what they do out there, but um, this is what was told to me by a couple of people that live out there, and uh, it was scared, scared the heck out of me, <laughs> so they, there's quite, you know, you hear, hear these stories about um, chupacabras and stuff down here in Texas, so. Yeah, man. Out out there. I'm with you on these sightings. I'm I'm with you on these sightings, and I I haven't I haven't seen one. Would love to. Um, I I just well I I, I don't, it makes you wonder. Um, is it something that uh, you know just just a species that doesn't want to be seen, right? Or is it yeah. something else? Is it interdimensional? Is it just coming into our timeline and hanging out and splitting? And that's why we can't find any evidence of it. I I just don't know what's going on. But there's way too many sightings for it to be, you know, people's imagination or urban legend or some big myth. Yeah, I I uh, after what I saw, I mean, I, I that just totally blew my mind. I mean, we were out there, you know, looking for UFOs in the sky, and was not looking for something like that, and and that took place, and. Uh, and I was with a guy that was real ske- real skeptic, you know, and uh, and it blew his mind, scared him really bad, and uh, <laughs> and I, I, it shook me up. Yeah, I'll tell you. And I, and we got out of there, and uh, um, there's some weird stuff out, in, you know, out in the woods. Uh, <laughs> yeah, man. So. All uh, right. Hey, Josh, thank you for, for uh, calling in tonight and giving us that report, sure, man. man. You're my hero, Happy brother. Birthday. You're my hero. <laughs> I'll talk to you, Josh. You too, man. There you Love go. You, you got it. Love you right back. Josh, I haven't... Look, you know, it's it's as many things as I have seen in the sky. And I got my little ghost thing and my little visitor that one day in the room. is, But I've never seen... Uh, a Bigfoot. I've never seen any kind of uh, cryptozoological creature or something I can't explain or Mothman or Dogman or, uh, you know, dogs with, uh, you know, shadow figures with red eyes floating winged. Have not. I have not. I would I would uh, invite the day that something like that would go down. Man, the phone calls are coming in. You know what? All right, look, if you're on hold, stay right there. I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring you in in just a second. Just stay right there. Um, I've got a bunch of, uh, and I'm running out of time here. I've got a bunch of news stories that I've got to get to uh, tonight, uh, including this uh, crazy, crazy story out of uh, um, uh, uh, near um, at Sioux, Louisiana, actually, and the island chain and the art that was just found there and how old it is. So I will get to that before we leave tonight. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? You're live. Three, two, one. All right. So that gives me time now. Art and jewelry dating back to the last ice age has been unearthed in a cave in Indonesia. A discovery that suggests that the people who lived there at the time were obviously more culturally advanced than most experts think or talk about. The artifacts, which include pendants and beads made from the bones of pig deer and monkey-like marsupials, date back 22,000 to 30,000 years ago. 
Archaeologists discovered the artifacts in, in Wallacea, a 1,000-mile-wide zone of mainly Indonesian islands separating Southeast Asia from Australia. And the items are now shedding light on the colonization of this area and nearby Australia. Previous research found that modern humans reached Wallacea by about 47,000 years ago. Now, check this out. The earliest known cave art on Sulawesi, discovered in 2014, dates from at least 40,000 years ago and is now believed to be the oldest cave art in the world. Those handprints and 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 what looks like you know uh, cows or buffalo, those are extraordinary, just like uh, Spain and and France. What's going on in Sulawesi is absolutely amazing. 40,000 years ago, they uncovered abundant evidence for a variety of symbolic behavior, suggesting a flourishing artistic culture. And this existed on Sulawesi during the tail end of the last ice age. The photographs are incredible. The story is incredible. You need to see the pendants, beads, I think about this 30,000 years ago, it wasn't supposed to exist. It's amazing. Now, earlier today, I'm hoping that this chills out, but it doesn't look like it's going to go that way because North Korea fired another quote unquote projectile into the sea of Japan. And now they're saying it was indeed another ballistic missile. The missile was fired from a site in the vicinity of Sinpo, South Hamgyong province. The United States has grown increasingly wary of the pace of North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile programs as the regime has now fired several tests in the first two months of this year. And with that, the White House announced the clock has now run out. And all options are on the table. End quote. They are officially done. We've got uh, the president of China is going to be here in a day. And uh, it looks like the White House is done. They've asked for China to step in. It feels like something is about to break. And I hope it doesn't. I hope China steps in and takes care of business. Because if it's us... The DMZ and all hell is going to break loose over in, uh, in South Korea, North Korea. So there you go. The clock has now run out and all options are on the table. And, you know, what does it mean? Military option? I don't know how much further we can go with sanctions. You know, and all sanctions have to be on the China side because China is the only person doing any trading, any country that's doing any trading with uh, North Korea. All the money comes through the China border. So think about that. Unbelievable. Now, you want you want the job where you do nothing, right? Everybody wants that gig. You know, you just get paid to do nothing. I get I get paid to do nothing. Well, sleep is the final frontier for French scientists studying microgravity as they seek 24 men willing to eat and perform all bodily functions in bed for 60 days. How much do you get paid? 16,000 euros. The 24 successful candidates, you have to be fit and sporty males, you have to be in shape, aged 20 to 45, who do not smoke, you can't have any allergies, and boast maximum body mass index of between 22 and 27, and you'll undergo a battery of tests two weeks before and two weeks after spending two months in bed. So you get 16,000 euros for three months' worth of work. Now, those tempted to apply would be expected to eat, wash, and perform all bodily functions while lying in bed on your back. The rule is to keep at least one shoulder in contact with the bed or its frame at all times. 
Dude, you would run out of Netflix in the first four days. Think about that. 60 days on your back. Could you do it? And you know what? I don't know if I could, but I wouldn't do it for 16,000 euros. Think about that for a second. You always wanted the ultimate gig, right? Just sit around and watch TV all day? (laughs) Well, here you go. The next time someone sends you a song on your iPhone, you better consider if the sender is trustworthy because Apple today killed two, well, announced, they killed two vulnerabilities with its iOS 10.3 upgrade that allowed malicious code to run as soon as an audio file, audio file ran on its phones. Now, an anonymous hacker working with Trend Micro's Zero Day Initiative, the ZDI, Disclose the bugs, which affects Apple TV and Watch OS as well. Defined as a memory corruption flaw, Apple said that it addressed the problem with improved input validation. For undisclosed reasons, ZDI wasn't permitted to talk about the bugs until today. Now, it appears to be similar to the exploit of Google's Android operating system that happened back in 2015, which I talked about on this show. And researchers discovered that they could hide exploit code in MP3s and MP4s. The problems derived from the way Android processed metadata within the music files. Now, let me tell you, this is how it happens. This is what's trippy. And, you know, we've known about this with malware um, uh, on computer systems for a long time. Why it's taken so long to address this with iOS and Android is beyond me. But you get uh, you get a file, and in the metadata it says the file length is this. And so as it goes through the system, if the file length has changed by whatever, and it's not the same as what it's supposed to be in the metadata, that is most likely a virus that has been tagged along into the file. That's how you get an infected file. File length is incorrect. But for some reason... With Apple and with Android, but with Apple, which lasted for almost two years longer, they weren't checking the file lengths of these MP3s. So you get a song, you bring it in, and the second you hit play, you're infected. How is it possible that the most simplest way of getting a file onto your system like that embedded into another file with with the metadata sh- saying what the file length is, and they weren't checking for those file lengths? I mean, it's the basic of most basics, right? There you go. All right. This has been Fade to Black. What a great show tonight. Jack Carey, thank you so much. Everybody, just go over to jimmychurchradio.com, click on the PIA uh, website. It's right there, and go and check it out. It is complete and an amazing website. And tomorrow night, Anil Pandy is going to be here. You're going to want to hang out for this show for a lot of different reasons. But one, he's the perfect guest at the perfect time because I've been talking about this and the quantum side, the quantum theory, quantum mechanics sides of another dimension, another world being out there. All right. That's what we're going to do tomorrow night. And amongst other things, too, as well. Tomorrow night, Anil Pandy. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Mark D. Kovar. Special thanks to LJ3, Renee Jonas. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Fady Badell. Webmaster is Drew, the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. Thank you, Jack Carey. Can't wait to get J.C. Johnson on this show. This broadcast is only copyrighted 2017 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me right now on Twitter at J Church Radio. Until tomorrow night, I want everybody to be safe. Go Beckley Tappy.